Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission to order. It's our uh, January 13th, 2020 meeting. If we'd all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And at this point in time, I'd like to introduce the members of the commission that are here this evening. To my far right is Jamie Hine, who is an alternate on the commission. Next to Jamie is commission member Jeff Cohan. And to my immediate right is James Fitzsimmons, also a commission member. To my immediate left is J.P. Benoit, who is the uh, vice chairperson of the commission. And next to uh, J.P. is uh, Rocco Matarazzo, who is the uh, secretary of the commission. At the staff table to my left is uh, Cheryl Ann Tubby, who is our uh, recording secretary, and next to uh, Cheryl Ann is Casey Han, who is our town planner. I'm Jim Seichter, the uh, chairperson of the commission. Our uh, next order of business would be approval of the minutes of our December 9th, 2019 meeting. Any commission members uh, that would like to make any uh, changes, corrections to the uh, minutes? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve the minutes of December 9th, 2019. We have second. a motion second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And with that, it brings us to our uh, first item on our agenda. But before I do that, I'll jump to uh, our second item of our uh, second item on our agenda, which is a uh, it's a public hearing. It's a warehouse. It's a, a special permit for a warehouse and distribution center for Jay Dewey on the behalf of BL Companies, 425 South Cherry Street. That applicant has requested that the uh, application not be heard this evening. Apparently, there's. Uh, other work that needs to be done on it. Now it brings us to uh, our first item on the agenda, again, which is a continuation of a public hearing. It's a uh, special permit distribution operation and office for Benchmark Land Development, LLC, at 988 East Center Street. And uh, Mr. Matarazzo, you please uh, note all correspondence for the record. If the applicant would please come forward to begin preparing for the presentation. Mr. Chairman, we have correspondence um, to Casey Hand, uh, dated dated um, 12 16 2019 we have some correspondence um, from uh, Godfrey Hoffman Hodge uh, referencing stormwater maintenance plan and I don't see a date on that we have some uh, corresponding reference to uh, 988 East Center Street, History per Walling for Planning and Zoning, uh, dated 12-3-20. We have correspondence dated January 3rd, 2020, from uh, Casey Hand, Town Planner. I'm sorry, to Casey Hand, Town Planner, from uh, Deputy Fire Chief. Uh, some correspondence uh, to Casey Hand dated 12-6-2019 uh, and let's see. Uh, a number of uh, images of the property no date or uh, reference numbers on there um, correspondence from uh, Eric Kruger to uh, Marcus Puddick, say that right? Uh, dated um, 1 6 2020. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some correspondence from Casey Hand to Dennis Seneviva, dated uh, 10 9 2019. An inner office memorandum uh, to Casey Hand, town planner from Eric Kruger, senior engineer. Dated January 8th, 2020. Uh, Inter office memorandum to Casey Hand, town planner from Eric Kruger, senior engineer, dated January 8th, 2020. And an inner office memorandum to Casey Hand, town planner from Eric Kruger, senior engineer, dated January 13th, 2020. And I believe that's it. Uh, Mrs. Hand, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, the 
second meeting that we had on this application, that was continued and the third one was continued. On, well, it wasn't a meeting, but on, the, on our meetings that we had. But the items, I want to make sure we have everything in the record. We should start off with A1. Is that not correct? Because that was given to us for the second meeting, which I think was... Yeah, so you've acknowledged everything into the record received through the October meeting when the That's public correct. hearing was opened. And what everything since then has not been acknowledged, so the stuff you got in last month's packet should get read in. So we start, just so I'm clear, we're starting with A1 and we run through from last month, one double D, correct? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And I have a I hard go start with copy if you need it. Okay, we have uh, correspondence from uh, Casey Hand to Angie Conti, uh, dated 11-19-2019. We have a memorandum to Casey Hand Town Planner from Marion O'Hare Environmental Planner, dated November 26, 2019. Uh, we have uh, correspondence of a certified letter um, dated November 8, 2019. We have a memorandum to uh, Planning and Zoning Commission members uh, from Janice Small Corporate Corporation Council, dated November 7, 2019. We have just some reference to um, impact on uses at 988 East Center Street. Uh, no date that I can see. We have a memorandum to uh, Joseph Sentner, uh, Deputy Fire Chief uh, from Casey Hand Town Planner, dated November 7th, 2019. We have inner office memorandum to Casey Hand Town Planner from Eric Kruger, Senior Engineer, dated November 6, 2019. Uh, some Correspondence uh, with reference to Great Oak Realty LLC dated November 6, 2019. Correspondence dated November, uh, sorry, May 21st, 2019 from Casey Hand, Town Planner to uh, Joseph uh, Setnar, Deputy Fire Chief. Um, it's like a Corresponding letter dated March 21st, 2019. Um, special permit, uh, a reference to a special permit number 411-19 dated November 7th, 2019. Correspondence dated March 8th, 2019 um, to uh, Town of Wallingford. Correspondence, uh, correspondence referencing special permit for 988 East Center Street um, from Angie Conti. I don't know if I'm saying that right. Yeah. Um, to uh, Casey Hand, town planner, dated 11-5-2019. Uh, An image of the site dated uh, 9-20-2019. Correspondence from uh, Dennis Senaviva to Casey Hand dated 11-13-2019. Uh, correspondence dated November 11, 2019 uh, to uh, Chairman Jim Seichter. Memorandum to Planning and Zoning Commission members from Janice Small Corporation Council, dated October 31st, 2019. Uh, Interdepartmental referral referencing application 411-19, dated August 9th, 2019. Correspondence dated November 4th, 2019. Uh, 
Michelangelo Conti. Um, correspondence dated November 2nd, 2019, uh, to Planning and Zoning Commission Town Hall. Uh, correspondence uh, referencing a special permit for uh, 988 East Center Street from Angie, Angie Conti, uh, dated 11-5-2019. Copy of the application for variance um, dated 6 9 2018. Just a correction on that, it's dated 3 6 69. It was variance number 69 18. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> uh, this is. Um, these are assessor's cards assessors, for the assessors property. Cards? Yeah. Okay. Uh, assessor's cards dated 4-13-2011. Uh, they're all the same numbers. This is would, would be uh, vision ID 14646. Again, assessor's cards dated 226-2002. Vision ID 14646. Again, I, I'm assuming it's another assessor's card? Yeah, the next one is the 1960 assessor's card for the property. Um, I don't see a date on there. Yeah, I just wrote it in at the top. There is the assessment date on it is, um, goes through 4263, it looks like. It's kind of hard to find on there. Yeah, I don't know if it's cut off on this one. Uh, again, assessor's card, card number 20. And I don't see the date on this one. That's part of the same, part same, of the same card. One. Yeah. Uh, some correspondence um, dated December 2nd, 2019. From um, to Casey Hand Town Planner, from uh, Jeffrey Dewey, Senior Engineer. All right, scratch that. Yep. Uh, correspondence dated December fifth, two thousand nineteen, Attention Planning Zoning Commission. From uh, Mary. Zane Zook, Zuck. Uh, a memorandum to Planning and Zoning Commission from Rob Baltimoritis, uh, Department of Engineer, dated December 6, 2019. Correspondence from Dennis Seneviva to Casey Hand, uh, dated 12-9-2019. Thank you very much, Mr. Matarazzo. And before I ask the applicant to begin his uh, presentation, uh, you may recall at our October meeting there were four commission members here, uh, Mr. Uh, Benoit and Mr. Matarazzo, commission members were not at this meeting. They've indicated to me that they have reviewed the, uh, the, uh, the video of the meeting, they've reviewed all the correspondence, so uh, they've indicated they're prepared to uh, you know, sit on this application. So the individuals that will be acting on this application will be the five commission members, uh, Mr. Cohan, Mr. Fitzsimmons, Mr. Matarazzo, Mr. Benoit, and myself. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to the applicant to uh, continue his uh, presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Before we do that, can I interrupt for one second? Sure. Just to clarify a couple of the items on the record, just so they're clear for the record in case it comes up so everybody knows everything got included. Um, attachment 1X was um, a collection of additional assessor's cards from over um, primarily, that was 2011, and then attachment 1Y was from 2001. That was attached to something else, so it didn't get called out as a separate attachment. Um, 
attachment 1G and 1Q are the same thing, which were the November 11th, 2019. That was a letter from D. Warren and Penelope Williams, just so they know their letter got into the record. Um, and 1K, you did reference that. And 1K, which you referenced, is from Art Jones. Yep, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Hand. And again, with that, if the applicant would please uh, begin his, uh, continue his presentation. Just, can I just ask one question? The information that you just passed out, was that previously included in our packet? Is that not correct? I think the conditions of approval, or your proposed conditions of approval were, unless they've been modified. No, no, they, they haven't. What's, what's been expanded is what I've just passed out. And again, for your record, Dennis Senevita representing the applicant. Um, I've passed out what is really kind of a primer for the presentation tonight. I thought it might make it easier as I go through okay. um, answering the questions that were left from the last meeting. Okay. So again, for your record, my name is Dennis Senevita. I'm with the Senevita Law Firm. I represent the applicant. To my left is Marcus Potuk, who is our project engineer from Godfrey Hoffman. And to my right is David Palumbo, a member of Benchmark Land Development. Also here this evening is John Connolly, who is the Vice President of Operations for the Genesee Wyoming Railroad, in case there are any questions that this commission may have about the railroad operation that is uh, uh, east of the site. When we last appeared, Mr. Chairman, um, your commission was, was um, clear in, in some of the directions that they were looking for, some of the information being sought from that last meeting. And there were items left to be addressed. One was the history of uses at the site. I know Mrs. Han has passed out a, um, one of your exhibits, has a summary of some of the uses, over, many of the uses over the past, I guess, 60 years. Um, also, there was a question about the factors for consideration uh, when there is another non-conforming use being sought to locate at a site where there's an existing non-conforming use and, and that one must be no more objectionable in character than the existing uh, non-conforming use or the previous non-conforming use. We had to talk about those factors. Uh, there was a concern about the operation of the train during delivery and pickup of railroad cards on the railroad spur, which is immediately adjacent to the site. Its impact, if any, on the East Center Street Railroad Crossing. I think specifically there was a request for more information from the fire department so that they could opine and, and figure out whether or not this was a particular concern of theirs. And then I think there was just some discussion raised by a member of the public about issues of a railroad exemption from local zoning ordinances. And that one I'm, I'm not going to address. I think that's not germane necessarily to the Commission's uh, activity tonight. So. The history of the site, you've got that as an exhibit from uh, Mrs. Hand. It goes back to 1955. Um, you'll note that the uses in 1980, Peter Fresina, building contractor, was listed as a warehouse. Uh, Latanzi, Latanzi Tile was also there, apparently. And it uh, shows roughly about 4,000, a little over 4,000 square feet in building area at that time that was occupied. There was an overhaul of the zoning map in 1985, um, changed from a CB zone to CA. The assessor's card in 1990 listed the primary structure as warehouse. Again, that was a use, even though the warehouse use is not a permitted use in the CA zone. It includes a warehouse building, uh, several warehouse buildings, as noted in Mrs. Hand's memo. Um, and that was referenced, I guess, from assessor's cards that are also part of your record. In 2002, the assessor's card again use, uh, lists the use primary as commercial warehouse, still a non-conforming use. Again, Peter Frasina, building contractor, and I think those are pretty much the same buildings that were noted in the 1990 assessor's card. Uh, the zone was incorrectly listed as R18. It was, of course, also the CA zone back in 2002. One of the things that we presented is there's uh, Great Oak Realty purchased the property and the assessor's card 2010-2011 continues to, uh, to uh, note this operation here, the primary use as commercial warehouse. And in um, one of the exhibits and what's been handed out to you this evening, in, a, in a, I think hopefully a more organized form, is a letter from Great Oak Realty, which is the entity that owned the property to indicate uh, Lisa Fitch has prepared the letter 
It's dated November 6th, and she indicates that she and um, her husband had purchased the property and they used it for her husband's company known as New Haven Partitions. It was basically their, she calls it a lay down area and or drop yard. And so what I wanted to do is uh, the first page in, in what I've submitted tonight, Mr. Chairman, is just sort of identifying in a way that attempts to compare the previous use to the one that's uh, there today with Mr. Palumbo's uh, operation. And I know from one of the memorandums from, a, from Attorney Small, she indicates that there are several factors to consider um, traffic, etc. cetera, uh, and, I'll, and I'll talk about those also uh, during the evening. Now, what I tried to do is, is just sort of look at the number of employees when you compare the number of employees for the, the uh, transloading operation. Again, there's only one um, operator who get, takes the sand uh, from, the, from the train car. Uh, and there's one truck driver. So there's no more than two employees there at any one time. Uh, and uh, that is different from the previous New Haven partitions who used the site as a drop yard for their New Haven operation, which had about 150 employees. Uh, fewer than that, obviously, were at this site. But this was the site where they stored materials on site. And she indicates, Ms. Ms. Fitch indicates in her letter, the types of materials, um, which is uh, point number three on impact, uh, the materials that are currently uh, stored, if you will, on site or handled on site with um, Mr. Palumbo are two kinds of sand. They're used in concrete for the Laticrete operation in Connecticut, and there's a conveyor. So those are the two pieces of uh, two types of material and the equipment that's on site. There's nothing more. There's no bulldozers, backhoes, uh, as there has been in the past. The hours of operation have been uh, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., although... In discussions with Mrs. Han, we've proposed um, shorter hours than that. Um, and the operation, according the previous operation of New Haven Partitions, according to the letter from uh, Mrs. Fitch, was uh, we access the property at all times of the day or night, seven days a week. Vehicle restrictions. Uh, one of the things that was very important to um, town staff was that any of the trucks that uh, exit the site would have to take a right out from the site onto East Center Street, uh, again, should this be approved, and then take a right onto I-91. So there would be no traffic that would, uh, no truck traffic that would go down East Center Street in either direction other than that short distance from the uh, driveway 988 East Center to the entrance ramp uh, on 690, uh, on, on 91 rather. In terms of the overall size of the operation, there was about 4,000 square feet of buildings there previously under all the operations that were noted in Mrs. Hand's memo um, back to 1980. Um, I think we noted in our October meeting that those some of the buildings became unattractive, dilapidated. We had raised them, my client had raised them, and the only thing that's left is, the, is that office, which is about 1,200 <coughs> square feet in, si in size. Actually, a little less than that, but that's what's being proposed for the new building. It's 1,200 square feet. And I think you've seen the rendering of that uh, attractive building, primarily office. Uh, the average time of operation on site, again, based upon Mrs. Fitch's letter, was about 12 hours a day. This operation, um, the current operation with Mr. Palumbo, it takes about two hours a day. There's only, um, there's periodic trucks that go to the site to obtain the, the sand, bring it to their end user, which is Laticrete. Um, we've provided information, I think, in the previous hearing about the number of, of truck trips. Uh, one of the suggestions from the planner was to uh, propose a limit on the number of truck trips per day and per week. Because there are a number of days when there are no truck trips. I mean, there's, it's only a question of need on the part of the end user, which is the Laticrete company, so that um, as I talked to you about the proposed conditions of approval, one of the things that um, we're proposing is to limit the number of truck trips per day to five. And uh, the expectation is that number probably will not even be reached, but we wanted to be cautious and conservative and no more than 20 truck trips per week. That's more, frankly, than, than access the site in, in 2019. Overnight equipment and vehicle outside parking, 
materials have to be inside in the in that zone, at least for the commercial warehouses in the past. But according to the letter from Mrs. Fitch, they, the the uh, New Haven partitions had several trucks of bulldozer and a backhoe parked outside. The only thing on this site currently under this operation as proposed is, is the conveyor. that You see that's partially located on the railroad property and partially located on the eastern side of, of Mr. Palumbo's property. Number nine, the number of trucks idling on the site. I don't know if there were any trucks idling under New Haven partitions, but there would be none for Mr. Palumbo's site. Idling of trucks uh, was a consideration, also a concern mentioned by the by the town planner, and that's uh, and that's uh, a condition that uh, we've proposed, uh, and that's what we're uh, and that's where we would be bound to no trucks idling. So when the deliveries occur, the truck would go to the site, they would turn off their engines, wait for the uh, sand to be placed into the uh, the truck, the truck would engage again and leave the site, taking a right out onto East Center and a right onto I-91. Rail cars received on site, um, number 10, it's just for clarity purposes, none of the rail cars are on Mr. Palumbo's property. They really are completely on the railroad property. Again, we have John Connolly, the Vice President of Operations, to talk to you a little bit about the operation of the railroad and, and the fact that um, Mr. Palumbo's business, as important as it is, is about 4% of the, of the business that's undertaken by the railroad uh, on this track. I think number 11 was important. Last time there was a concern because we did not, we failed, I failed to properly address the methodology of, of uh, deliveries uh, by the railroad. There was concerns about how long would the gate, gates on the East Center Street crossing be down. Important issue. And so one of the things that we did get is a letter uh, that's attached to this from uh, Mr. Connolly, again, who's going to go up to the board at some point and explain the process for you. Uh, but all deliveries will occur north of the crossing. The actual spur connection is about 500 feet from the railroad crossing north. You'll, you'll see it as we go, as we make the presentation, so that once the train has driven past the uh, East Center Street grade crossing, the, the gates will go up. So during the, any delivery or pickup uh, process, the gates will always be up. They will not impact at all, and I think that was important to the Deputy Fire Chief who's noted that in, in his letter also, one of the documents that you have tonight. And traffic from the site, again, it was operated previously as a drop yard for a, lar for a large construction company, trucks, cars, accessing the site until the job was done. Again, we generally have, have over the past year, we've had three trucks per day. Uh, again, as we're suggesting a cap at five, should this be approved. That's been the average. We've taken the number of actual truck trips which Mr. Palomo can can monitor and divide it by the 360 uh, by the I think we divide it by the five days a week the six days a week operation it was three three point two trucks per day and one car per day and that's the the manager or the office uh, fellow who actually helps make certain that the conveyor is properly hooked up to the train and hooked up to the um, tanker that's taking the, the sand away there's also, Mr. Chairman, there's a second, um, we did a second list of impacts because, as you may recall, at the last meeting that we, that we attended, there was some concern as to whether or not New Haven Partitions was there legally. Had they been there with the knowledge of the town or, or, or not? And there was some concern about that. And so one of the things that Mrs. Hand did for um, uh, the commission for me was to put together this list of the history. And so we also wanted to compare uh, the operation that we're proposing to Mr. Fresina's operation back in 1990 and 2002, which was uh, an acknowledged pre-existing non-conforming use at the site. Again, he operated a, he was a building contractor and had a woodworking business there. Um, I don't know the number of employees, but again, I suspect that it would, it would have to be at least equal to the two, that's the maximum number of employees on our site, uh, and probably greater. Materials and equipment stored on site, according to the report, these are all warehouse buildings. He, so he had 4,000 square feet of warehouse space for construction materials, the operation of his business, construction equipment, and again, all that we store are two kinds of sand and have the conveyor on site. Hours of operation, I think, for construction, it's fairly typical. You start at 7 a.m. Again, that's an assumption, to be fair. I want to make that clear to this 
commission, but again, it was a construction company and a woodworking business. Uh, no vehicle restrictions on any of the trucks that accessed that site during his operation. Uh, he was there, again, it appears he was, he was there when the property was zoned CB, which does allow warehousing, from what I understand, and so that uh, that use would have been permitted at the time that he first moved in. <coughs> the number and size of the buildings occupied were, were four, little over 4,000 square feet of, of buildings. And again, we're down to our proposal is one building at 1,200 square feet. No limitation on the hours of operation. Um, our business itself, because of the number of, of trips, and each trip takes about each delivery from the railroad car to the Palumbo trucking tanker takes about 25 minutes. Uh, thereabouts. About, it doesn't take any longer than 30 minutes from the time he's there uh, to actually load. So that we're, we estimated two hours of, of actual operational time on that site during a day. Even though the hours are more expansive, that's because the trucks may come at different times. But it's not a constant operation. It's not trucks continuing to go and flow on the site. It's uh, no more than about two hours per day of activity. Again, Mr. Fusina had a construction yard, so there were several trucks. Uh, we had the conveyor. Uh, no trucks will be idling on our site. Uh, unknown as to how many railroad cars he might have gotten. Uh, but again, there is, it was operated as a construction yard for construction business. And, um, and I, would sus I would allege or, or suggest that our use is certainly no more objectionable in terms of we're a lesser square footage, arguably a lesser number of employees, uh, a lesser activity in terms of truck trips and vehicle trips in and out of the site. Uh, um, no more objectionable in a sense that we have limitations should you grant this on the directions the trucks can go. Um, and the fact is that we're prepared to uh, comply with uh, ob the uh, suggested conditions from Mr. Kruger, for example, and the one we came, we got today that be no hazardous materials on site. And that certainly is, an, it, frankly, it's an easy one to agree to because that was not something Mr. Palumbo would want to undertake there in any event. These are, again, these are just sands that are used in the Latta Creek Company. I'm going to ask um, John Connolly, who again is the Vice President of Operations for the Railroad, if he wouldn't mind going up to the easel and just sort of giving this commission an idea as to the methodology on how the railroad handles deliveries and pickups from uh, this particular site. There's a microphone on the edge of the desk. First, thank you. Thank you very much for taking the time to hear me. And, and uh, Dennis um, thought it would be helpful. Um, I really need to start out with an apology because, you know, hey, sir, if you just introduce yourself, just for the record, if you would, please. I would. Uh, my name is John Conley. As Dennis said, I'm the vice president of operations for Genesee and Wyoming's Northeast Region which encompasses the whole northeastern corner of, of the um, United States. Thank you. Um, you're welcome. Thank you again. Uh, so, like I was saying, really need to start out with an apology because the railroad industry being about 200 years old, a lot of times you don't put a mic microscope on, on an operation or a particular thing that's fairly de, minim de minimis within the operation of a region or, or an organization until something brings it to light. And... This, this concern from Mr. Palumbo um, in the time that we blocked the crossing allowed us to, to shed some light on what we were doing um, on this corridor and, and make some operational improvements. So just for everybody's reference, um, obviously here is East Center Street. There is the spur track uh, that, that is in question as well as our main line that continues um, up through Middletown and down towards New Haven. And for the longest time, because in an industry that's 200 years old, you often do what you've always done. We would formally cut the cars and the train that was continuing northward south of Center Street. The crew would take some cars up here and work the industry and then shove back. Now, with the circuitry of a railroad, and I don't want to get down in the weeds, but every time the motion sensors predict the train moving backwards, the gates would activate, right? Now, again, it was de minimis to us, but I can't imagine the frustration for the, the people that lived there or had to, you know, 
um, transverse the, the crossing there, traverse the crossing there. So what we've done is uh, now with the blocking, um, as Dennis alluded to, the, the total traffic for this site is only about 4% of the traffic that we move up and down this line. So it is a very small amount of the traffic. And that allows us to operate differently where the train coming northbound out of New Haven, this traffic would be placed on the rear end plus one car. So what would happen on, on the days that we switch this operation going forward, and it started with last week, um, the train crew would pull across the crossing just like any other train that traverses this when we're not stopping to switch uh, Palomo trucking. And as long as you clear this crossing by 150 feet and stop, cut that one car off, we cut that off so we don't expose our employees to further risk with removing end of train devices, that sort of stuff. That circuitry reads as if the train has stopped. Those gates go up, don't come back on until that train starts to move. And if, as long as it continues to move north, they never go on again. So that allows us to leave one car about 150 feet clear of this crossing, come up here with the train, work the train, switch out the empties against that one car, put the loads into the facility, tie back onto the train and go north with only activating that crossing one time, just like any other train that goes through there, whether there's Palumbo traffic on it or not. So it would be a minimal disruption going forward of East Center Street. And like I said, this, this examination allowed us to make that improvement that will that'll hopefully allow a lot of the dissatisfaction or frustration you have with you know, pedestrians in that area. So any questions? Commissioner Members, any questions for you? Yes, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I happened to be over there a few weeks ago. This was after the, the last meeting. And I, I saw the train uh, actually stop. The, the, the train was coming north. You know, the gates went down. It stopped at 50 yards south of the Center Street crossing. The engineer actually got out of the, you know, engine car. He got out and, you know, the gates were down. And I happened to be running, so I... Gates were down, he stopped the train. I said, okay, I'm gonna go across, so I, I ran across. And he climbed out of the uh, engine and he, he ran over to the, the gate and did something. I don't know exactly what he did, but um, shortly after that, the gates came up. So there were some you know, cars there and you know, the traffic went through. Right. But the train was still stopped south of that crossing. And then after a couple minutes, you know, when the traffic got through, you know, he got back into the engine and um, proceeded to move forward. You know, the gates came down again. Right. And, you know, I stuck around for a few minutes and he, he pulled up and you know, I watch him unload the cars. But I'm, I'm wondering, you know, what he was doing. And I, I, I don't assume that's... An everyday occurrence that is not going to happen every time. I apologize. I want you to finish your question. Sorry about that. Yeah, basically that's it. You know, I assume it's a, you know, one-time thing. That's that's not a procedure or a process that's going to happen every time the train comes through. Not at all. Not at all. And it, like I said, this examination over the last few weeks, um, last Monday was the actual first day that we implemented the new process for switching this facility. So there should be no need, unless it's an emergency breakdown or mechanical failure of some sort, that you would ever see a train stop south of Center Street in, in the future. And they, he, there's a deactivation button that he could have triggered that allows if he stopped there for any reason to, you know, it's a single track railroad, so he doesn't have to right. worry about oncoming tracks or oncoming trains. Um, so he can deactivate that crossing, essentially tells the equipment, stop paying attention to my wheels here that are shunning this track. And then as soon as you start to move again that train, it automatically you know, senses motion and, and reactivates itself. But no, that would not be, it would, it would be from this point going forward, from last Monday going forward, you should only see a straight northbound move and a straight southbound move. Now, if you stop at the crossing, is, did you say you were running? Yes. Okay, so just if you were running and stopped, <clears throat> I'm getting short on reference here, this is east, right? That's going west. The, right. All right. So if you're stopped west of the crossing and you look up beyond the building and the tree line, all right, you might see them stop north and doing some shuffling around. But that one car should be on the main track, which will 
which will not allow those crossing lights and gates to be activated. Right. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, based on my description, do you have any idea what he was doing? Again, he was south of the crossing. And not, he actually climbed out of the, the yeah, car. Yeah, not knowing directly. <laughs> I mean, it could have been. I've been in the industry for 31 years, so I hope this doesn't come across as inappropriate. It could have been that the conductor had to relieve himself. No. And not. it could have been that they know they know East Center Street is a area of attention, and they didn't want to block traffic. I mean, I, I'm thinking that's probably what it was. There were there were a few cars there, and he may have just, you know, this one time let them go through. Right. Okay. And it's great to switch facilities like that at two o'clock in the morning until you start waking people up. And and engineers generally, especially on the Providence of Worcester Railroad, are, are generally very cognizant of the public and how much disruption they're causing. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commission members? All right. Thank you for your time. That answers that. So, Mr. Chairman, uh, members, uh, there was also uh, a concern mentioned uh, about the fire marshal, because I think last time with the fire department, they had only submitted in October a pretty cursory uh, a letter, and, and I know that there was a request that to ask the uh, fire department, you know, whether or not this was a concern. There was an initial letter from the deputy chief, which is part of your record. It was followed up by uh, a phone call by me. We never connected, uh, but we did leave messages, and I sent the, him a letter together with Mr. Connolly's letter, uh, which is also part of the packet you have in front of you. And I believe that he followed, that he, the deputy fire chief, followed that up with a, a second communication saying that he was satisfied as long as, as the... Um, activity of uh, picking up and delivering cars on the spur happened north of the site and that the gates would be up. He no longer had those concerns that he that he expressed in his earlier communication. If I could, I, I was a bit remiss with Mr. Connolly. He didn't indicate though when the uh, when the deliveries are made by the railroad. At what, what time of day? If you would, sir, please. The deliveries and pickup, if you would. Yeah, the, they, they occur simultaneously. So we only stop there one time during a day that we switch uh, the facility. These switches occur typically on Tuesdays and Thursdays, anywhere from around 11.30 in the morning to about 1.30, depending, in the okay. afternoon. So we try and hit non-peak hours and non-night hours, which, which seems to be least disruptive, especially now with our new operating plan okay. for hours. Thank you. I'm sorry, Mr. Attorney okay. Senevisa, if you Thank please you. continue. So we've also um, had submitted a proposed list of uh, conditions of approval, which is the last uh, piece of that uh, primer that, I, that I've handed out. And basically, again, I've reviewed this uh, with the planner. Um, the deliveries were very, very important. And so just as Mr. Connolly's indicated this evening, that's the... Uh, plan for the railroad moving forward, but railroads sell, they, they, they change ownership. Um, again, my client would, would certainly entertain a condition that all deliveries and removals of railroad cars, cars to and from the railroad spur abutting his property should occur north of the East Center Street Railroad crossing so that all deliveries and or removals will not be undertaken with the gates of the railroad crossing in anything but an upright position during the delivery removal process. And again, that's what Mr. Connolly is here. Um, trained in to tell us, and that would be the uh, condition. The railroad will not deliver or remove any railroad cars from the spur on Sundays. There was a concern, I think, that Laticrete sometimes has a need for sand on a Monday morning. We wanted to make sure that if that did occur, that it would not be a delivery of those cars uh, on Sundays. Sundays there's no activity at all on the site under this proposal. The applicant would operate its business on Monday through Friday during the hours of 7.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. with no truck drivers arising, arriving at the site before 7 a.m. They tend to arrive uh, before um, the, uh, the 7.30 time only because they're leaving uh, from some other location, but they would, the trucks would not be idling. They would be uh, no activity between uh, until 7.30 in the morning. No more than five trucks per day, again, during that period of time, and no more than 20 trucks per week may access the site. And I know as a practical matter it might be difficult to to um, keep track of that, but I suspect that there may be some neighbors that will be helpful in that regard. 
All trucks leaving the site shall turn right only onto East Center Street and take a right onto I-91 North so that there would be the ability that even though many of the trucks are heading to Ladder Creek, which would be south, that the, the, um, most of the, um, the time the trucks would turn either at exit 15 or, or 16. So they would head north, they would not go through East Center Street and no other portion of, of, this, of the town. No trucks would idle on the property. Once a truck enters the site and is lined up for sand delivery from the conveyor, it will turn off its engine until it's ready to leave the site. And certainly no overnight parking of trucks on this property. I think if any of you have driven by at night, you might see a Wallingford police car there. But other than that, there isn't much other activity on the site. I've kind of ignored, although I hope you haven't, the rendering of the building that's being proposed. It's really a very attractive looking building. It's, it's uh, designed to fit in with the, the railroad concept, if you will. Again, this has been a spur. The railroad property has been there for about 150 years or so at that site. Um, one of the things that uh, one of the letters from Mr. Connolly, an earlier one uh, from the railroad, indicates that there is a, there's a great value to having uh, the ability to move this material, the sand, by, by, by rail. It keeps a number of many, many trucks off the road uh, so that we're minimizing any impact on, on certainly the Wallingford uh, road system by, by having um, the rail cars deliver the sand uh, to the site. I know that um, Attorney Small, had, again, had indicated some factors to consider. Uh, I spoke with her again today to see if there's any update on what she might be providing to the commission. As to, you know, what, how do you determine what's, what is no more objectionable? And, and we had our, our conversation. Um, but again, it's a question of fact for the five of you, the five voting members. It, at the end of the day, um, your standard is kind of interesting. I know in many communities the standard for changing one non-conforming use to another is that the new one can be um, has to be less objectionable or, or less impactful. Your language is is interesting. Let me just say that it can be no more objectionable. And again, objectionable means from a zoning perspective, as you well know, I mean that's what you're looking at from you know and and I think that Attorney Small has given you some of those factors to consider, such as traffic. I mean, we have real good control on that. We also take up very little space of your town roadway system as part of our operation. So, um, again, we've been here for a while. Uh, we've been in front of wetlands for a year. This has been a long process. Um, and uh, I'm hopeful that this commission will see that uh, uh, the operation, which has been in place, I mean, and we talked about that in the first meeting because we didn't want to ignore it. There's no way to ignore it. We've been there without authority. Um, Mr. Palumbo, uh, threw himself on the sword in October to let you know that he understood that he had the right to operate um, based upon some information from the railroad, but that really is only as to the railroad property. We're not claiming any preemption at this point. Um, the property is owned by Mr. Palumbo's company, Benchmark Land Development. But at the end of the day, there have been, and I think you can check with your planner, there has been, I think, one complaint in, of the operation in the past four years, and that might have been what sort of set off this whole thing, um, the process uh, that we're here before you. So the operation is certainly much more attractive than it was uh, back at the time that he took over control. Uh, we think that with the, the railroad's um, process of, of getting deliveries to and from the site, that there won't be any impact on the, on the grade crossing. I think your deputy fire chiefs uh, opined the same. Um, we're agreeable certainly to any of the conditions that the other staff have placed on, on this proposal, this application, and uh, you know we look for this commission's support. Thank you. One thing before I ask uh, commission members and Mrs. Hand for her comments, uh, you know, Mrs. Hand, there was also some comments about front landscaping, and on the plan, you had mentioned that there was an area to the uh, applicant. Uh, there was some front landscaping uh, missing. If you could please speak, uh, just speak to that for a moment because the applicant didn't uh, include that in his presentation. Sure. Um, so the majority of my, um, my letter dating back to uh, I believe it's, hold on, I just had it up. Uh, 
August of two thousand August of this year, August twenty ninth of last year. Um, the majority of that has been addressed. So in, in terms of the, the design comments and anything related to that, um, the kind of one outstanding thing that didn't totally get hashed out was there's a 25 foot front landscaping requirement in this zone. And most of it was met, but on the, um, I guess, uh, south eastern corner, is that correct? the corner adjacent to the rail line out by East Center Street, um, that there was a little area where they weren't complying with the front landscaping requirement. Verbally, that's been agreed to, and I think there are some draft plans floating around that show that. Um, so that's why in my recommended conditions of approval to you, one of them is my letter dated August 29th, 2019. So. Um, that would include coming into full compliance with that requirement. So they, they would have to do that. So I would recommend with if you include my recommended condition number five, letter from Casey Hand, Town Planner to Benchmark Land Development, dated August 29th, 2019, maybe add language to say including provision of required 25-foot landscaped area. That's if we decided to approve the application. Yeah, yeah if you okay. were to Good. and include that condition. Okay, yeah. at this point in time, I assume that I just wanted to respond to that if I could. The only reason I didn't address it, Mr. Chairman, is because it's a requirement. So it wasn't something that I was suggesting that it be added as a condition of approval. We have to comply, and we've acknowledged that to your planner. Okay, and, and thank you. Commission. So that being said, at this point in time, you've concluded your presentation, although you may like to make further comments. So at this point, I'd open it up to questions uh, from the Commission members. Yes, Mr. Hine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have uh, just a couple questions. Um, this material that's being transported, um, it was being referred to as sand. Is it, is it a fine type of material like a sand or, a, or a cement or concrete or something like that? It's, uh, not, it's not cement, but it's actually a fine base. Uh, there's two different, two different products. There's a we call it a P90 sand and a P60. One's Sir, if you bring the microphone a little bit closer and speak right into there's, it. There's two different types of sand. One is called a P60, which is a coarser, and a P90, which is a more finer sand, but both sand products. Okay. Thank you. Um, and how does it get transferred from the train car to the truck? So these cars are called bottom drop rail cars. There's a conveyor that goes uh, underneath the car. The gates on the rail car open uh, essentially side to side. And this conveyor, uh, is, it's off hydraulics, goes up to the, top of the, uh, goes up to the bottom of the rail car. Uh, and there's two slots in the conveyor. The sand just drops onto that and goes up through a chute into the top of the tanker. Okay. And does does the the sand ever reach the open air? I mean, does it is it ever exposed to the open air during that process? The sand coming out of the rail car? Yeah. Um, sometimes it'll come out. You know, sometimes uh, uh, like this time of the year. Well, certainly not right now. It's not cold enough. But sometimes it's the gates have been frozen, and which means the the bottom few inches of that rail car might be frozen because the sand is is kiln dried, but by the time it comes from Canada or New Jersey, it, it builds moisture and sometimes the first couple inches may be frozen. So we'll have to either get a little bit of a chipping hammer or, or a bar and break it off and the sand could, you'll, you may see sand on the, on, the, on the rail tracks sometimes, yeah. There's, and then occasionally my son or uh, my nephew will go up there with the, with the machine and we clean it up and yeah. sometimes no. we actually use it for when the, it's icy over there. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I guess my question was, uh, you know, when it's on the conveyor, is it is it is that an enclosed yes, conveyor? Yes, I'm sorry. The conveyor is an enclosed box. Okay. Yeah, you have to, there's inspection ports that you can open to see it, but the conveyor itself is fully enclosed. Is the material ever stored on, on that site? I mean, is there ever a time, for example, where you might 
unload the train car into a truck and keep the truck there overnight or, or no. is there is there any instance in which the material itself would be stored on no sir what that what it'll do is if we if it's not if it's taken out of the rail car it's going into a truck and if Latta Creek can't take it then we'll bring it down to our North Brantford yard and keep it in trailers there and deliver from there to Latta Creek okay fair enough um, I think the last time um, th that you were here, we had established, I think, that um, you as the applicant have the burden of showing that this use is no, uh, no more ob objectionable than the prior use. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that we're all on the same page with that. Um, and I guess because of that, we need to determine what the prior non-conforming use actually was. And um, in going through the, um, the history of the property, I think that's listed as um, item 1GG, um, through you, Mr. Chairman, to Mrs. Han, Mrs. Hand, is this is this something that you um, your office created? Yeah. So this was something because I knew the commission had a lot of questions about what the previous situation was on the site. So I created this for the commission. This yeah. wasn't created for the applicant. This was created for the commission's information. So this was based on everything I could find in town hall so you could kind of make your determinate to, to try to inform your determination sure and, and I appreciate that and it does make it easier and I'd like to go through this if we can in, in a second but is this something that the office I mean to me it would seem like this is this would be something given that the applicant has a burden that this is something the applicant should be preparing and presenting to us as opposed to the office creating documents um, you know in relation to the to the application I, I, I I'm a little confused as to why the office would create a document like this as opposed to the applicant well I think as your staff part of my responsibility is to give you the information that we have available to us to try to assist you so and I'm asked to make determinations like this all the time so I frequently will do the background I mean a lot of times we have to issue compliance letters or things like that so we do do those that that those that background information and I honestly in this case I just thought this isn't I, I'm not taking a position per se I just thought it was important for me to give you the information that I had so that's that's why I did in order to try to minimize confusion I mean if so there's been some talk about the last user um, who I to be honest wasn't aware was there ever um, but there w there could very if they had approached me about locating there I would have had to make a preliminary determinant determination about whether or not they could locate there so that's not an uncommon so it's to try to give some some clarity and to try to provide some background information. But yes, I, I mean, I would agree that ultimately the onus is on the applicant to to sort of the or the burden of proof about um, whether they're not more objectionable or not. And ultimately, that's the commission's discretion. Yeah, and and, and please uh, don't misunderstand me. That's not a it's not a criticism of you or the office. Yeah, it's more a point to the applicant that the. This is information that I, I would have liked to have seen the applicant uh, present to us, um, uh, particularly given that the application has been pending for, for some time. Um, the, and I'd like to go through um, the history here. So um, according to this document in 1960, it looks like um, uh, the property was in the CB zone um, and was approved as a feed store and oil business, or, or at least that was permitted. Um, 
in the CB zone as of that time. Would that be accurate? Yeah, there's a file, and, and that's part of the reason why I did this too, is I have access to all of this information and I kind of know where it all is. Um, so there is a file, a very old file, um, that right indicates the property was CB. Um, 58 is when our current zoning map started, so that's when it shows it as CB, but there was a discussion about um, correcting the previous map, this whole CACB issue, and so that's where, when in the record, in the minutes from that record, that's when they made these representations. Yeah, and but but this property hasn't been used for a feed store or oil business for some time, correct? Not that I'm aware of, but you have as much information pretty much here as I do. So yeah. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I I think we can. Yeah, um, I would comfortably say that any that use has been abandoned for some time. Yeah, at least as far back as 1980. Right. In '69. Uh, there was a cer certificate of use approval for a gas station and gas service products, but again, the property's never been used for that purpose, and we can assume that that use has been abandoned. Um, in 1980, it appears that uh, from the tax assessor's card that the property was being used by uh, Mr. Frazina as a warehouse um, uh, probably for his contracting business. Is, is that fair? Yeah, so it would be a combination of sort of standard warehousing and contractor storage, which are essentially the same same thing, and it, that included Mr. Frazina and a company called Latianzi Tile. Yep. And, and the warehousing was permitted. It, it was in the CB zone at the time, and warehousing was permitted in that zone at the time, correct? Yes. Okay. In 85 is when things change. In 85, that property now goes from the CB zone to the CA zone, or yes, yeah, CB zone to the CA zone, correct? Yep. And at that point, um, warehousing is not permitted in the CA zone, correct? Right. Okay. So assuming that the assessor's card is correct and we can rely upon the assessor's card, um, then we have a non-conforming, a legally non-conforming use at that point, correct? Right. Okay. And then again, in nine, as of 1990, the assessor's card still refers to the um, uh, property being used as a warehouse, presumably by Mr. Frazina at that point, correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the same thing in 2002. And... My question, though, is that in 2010-2011, the assessor's card also, again, refers to commercial warehousing, uh, but the new owner is Great Oak Realty. Would that be fair? Yep, that's what the assessor's card indicates. Oh, okay. What sort of... piqued my interest a little bit was that when the application was first made or first came before us there was uh, there was a memo from your office to the applicant uh, dated August 29, 2019 and the first paragraph the first thing that said in the letter is the last use that this office was aware of at the property was a hobby woodworking facility this office was not aware of a construction yard as part of that use as indicated on the application. So my question then is, was it your offices or your understanding that this property was not being used for storage at some point or, and was being used at, instead as a hobby woodworking facility? So I think... Mr. Frazina, towards the end of his ownership of the property, my so, sort of anecdotal understanding was that he kind of tinkered on the property 
more so it so it became sort of less and less active and that's where I think the sort of the hobby woodworking came into place and that was more anecdotal information that was another reason why I went back and dug through to figure out what our documentation actually showed because I wanted to know too so that isn't as best I can tell that's not reflected there's no application for him to change the use there's no there's nothing in our in a record anywhere that shows that um but i think he may have just sort of for lack of a better term kind of evolved or devolved his use of the property to some degree that's the best i can determine but again that was anecdotal information not something i have any documentation of no and i appreciate that but i seem to remember Mr. Letourneau getting up and saying the same thing. Yeah. That, that, that's what he recalled. And I seem to remember some of the neighbors saying the same thing, that the property had been vacant for some time uh, right. and, and buildings were right. becoming dilapidated and he was using it as a woodworking shop. The reason why I bring that up is because we have a provision in our... Um, regulations here that says no nonconformity use which has been abandoned shall thereafter be resumed. It raises the question as to whether this warehousing was something that had been abandoned by Mr. Frazina before he sold the property to Great Oak Realty, in which case if it was abandoned, then Great Oak Realty would not have been permitted to start warehousing and, and storing construction uh, equipment there because it was in a CA zone by that point. It wasn't in a CB zone anymore. So, would, uh, would, I, would I be correct in that, that interpretation or that understanding? Well, I think, I, I mean, this is part of what we have to take the information that's available to us or the commission has to take the information that's available to you and make a determination. But really the question before you is whether this use is more objectionable than what's predetermined. So vacancy is not abandonment of a use. So if he stopped using say three of the four bill, and I don't have any way to know that. I have no documentation of exactly, and he didn't apply to do that. So to some degree, I, I'm not sure that that's a, was a valid use of the property. The same thing with Great Oak Realty in their outdoor storage of material. I would argue that there was no grand, I mean, if I were asked to make the determination, I would say that there was no grandfathering of the outdoor storage of material. So that's, I, w I would have objected to that portion of it. Um, I, I think the warehousing may have been sort of gradually become sort of, I mean, we all know that. We all know what the buildings sort of became over time. Um, so obviously the use of it was less significant over time. But hobby woodworking would have been called production. So, I mean, production has its own level of intensity or could arguably, I suppose, be called production. So I, I think he... But I think that's something that, that the commission ultimately has to determine is, is this is the information that we have available to us. This is the documented information. He didn't come in and apply to change the use to something else. Um, what exactly he did there, I, I don't, at the end, I don't know. Okay. Um, in, in getting back to that, that point of, about whether this use would be more intense or more um, uh, objectionable, or uh, no more objectionable. Um, you know, in CB zones allow more than CA zones, you, um, allow more uses, correct? Um, and this property is in a CA zone, not a CB zone. Correct. Correct. Well, I, I was taking a look at the regulations for the CB districts, and there's actually a provision in there. Um, now, CB zones allow warehousing, mm -hmm. 
and they allow construction storage. Um, and what 4.6 B7 says is it permits, subject to, a, to site plan approval, uh, retail lumber, fuel, and building material yards and contractors equipment storage provided that all material is kept in a building or within an enclosure of suitable height to screen the operation from the street and any nearby residence district. And here's, here's the interesting thing, but excluding the bulk storage of cement and concrete mixing and excluding tanks of petroleum products having a capacity greater than 10,000 gallons. I understand we're not dealing with cement or concrete mixing here, but our own regulations seem to make a, distinct, a distinction between just regular construction storage and doing things like what, what's happening here, which is transferring fine sand type material, um, storing it, transporting it, keeping it on the property. That, you know, our own regulations seem to make a distinction between simple storage and something more. And I think that that may be what we have here. So, um, you know, I, I appreciate what Mr. Palumbo's trying to do here. Um, in some respects, I think this property is a great location for, for what he's doing. On the other hand, it's in a particular zone and we have to pay attention to what our regulations provide. And when anybody ever comes in and says, you know, I want to continue a non-conforming uh, non use, but I want to change it a little bit, um, I think we have to take very, very close look at that. So, thank you. Thank you. Just a clarification, as far as any storage of material on the property, you're not storing any material on your property, are you? No, sir. I mean, the, the material that's being delivered in the rail cars is on the rail property, correct? Yes, sir. Correct. And when then it's delivered or when you offload, you're putting it in your trucks and removing it from the property, correct? Yes, sir. It's, it starts on the railroad property. The conveyor is on the railroad Ra property. Conveyor's my conveyor is on the railroad property, my... too. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And then my truck is on my property. Yes, sir. Okay. Other commission members? Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I too am still struggling with the no more objectionable uh, issue as well. But before I really get into that, I, I do have a couple of questions that will kind of answer my, my question on that. Uh, the traffic from the site, according to the, you know, the document, is three trucks per day. Um, so really it's six, six trips a day, correct? Um, you're going to have a truck coming in and a, and a truck going out. And I'm just wondering where the, the trucks coming in, how they get to your site. Do they, they come off, uh, you know, 91? We're going to propose that they come on and off 91. A lot of the trucks will come from Latticreed International, which is in Bethany, Connecticut. And then they'll come via the highway. And we're proposing that all trucks enter and exit from 91, period. Okay. So that, that could be a condition of approval. Correct. Um, the, the one thing that I, I really try to find in all this documentation based on the, the history, um, which I couldn't, couldn't, and maybe somebody could answer it, was when, the, when was the spur actually built? When was that? Well, there's, I don't, I can't answer to when it's been built. Maybe the railroad could, but this, uh, this has been an active line for close to 150 or more years. Um, there is, that spur has been there, um, and I think Mr. Connolly could probably answer that. He might be more in tune to it, but I believe this spur has been there for well over 100 years, that particular spur. And if, if you go back in time, um, there was an additional spur that is still presently there mm -hmm. that used to come onto the property to unload all of the coal and feed products 
that were there with those original buildings before we demolition those buildings, which the other spur comes right out off onto onto my property. So those two spurs have been there, I believe, and, and maybe the railroad can answer it, um, from the time of that main line going in, from when the feed store coal coal facility. There used to be a, they used to unload coal there back in the day as well. There was silos there that they used to uh, convey also similar to what we do, but it went into the ground, into a conveyor, and then up uh, uh, into a silo, from a bucket elevator, they used to call them. Okay, um, I'll, I'll, I'll agree with that. It's, you know, been there quite a long time. Um, and that's been in use uh, by the railroad ever since. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, the main question that I had for last meeting was, you know, I, I was concerned about the uh, the train crossing the uh, East Center Street, and um, I was happy that the and Mr. Senator Viva talked about it quite a bit um, about the memo from the deputy fire chief, and he's satisfied that this operation won't cause any you know emergency vehicle impacts, and I I'm happy with his response. So that you know was you know one of the big concerns that I had. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so now I, I, I really come to, you know, again, to follow on um, uh, Mr. Hines' uh, uh, comments about, um, you know, whether or not, you know, this operation is no more objectionable to what was there before. Um, you know, and I'm, I, I, we, we had a memo from Janice Small, and, you know, I'd just like to read, you know, one of the lines in it, which, um, you know, I, I, I guess I have a hard time interpreting what she actually said in this and what this commission has actually done in, you know, some of the requests we put to you. She says in the last paragraph, while it is appropriate to understand the involvement of the railroad in the site's operation, the commission has no authority to regulate the railway. The commission must focus on the use of the site by the applicant and compare it to the use presently allowed there. So, you know, technically with what we have proposed as far as how the train, you know, unloads and it goes north of East Center Street, we kind of are regulating the railroad. I mean, you've agreed to it, but, you know, in in my opinion, we kind of are regulating the railroad. So, you know, that being said, um, the, the operation itself, I don't find more objectionable to what was there previously. I, I really don't. I've been, you know by the operation many times. I've seen it work. You know, the, the one objection, uh, concern, um, that has been brought up by some of the residents and some of the letters is, you know, some of the diesel exhaust from the, the engine. And, you know, I stood 50, 75 feet away from the engine while it was stopped there. And let me tell you something, it, the fumes are overwhelming. Now, you know, is that a big concern? I, I, I was really, you know, again, 50, 75 feet away. And, you know, most of the houses are much farther than that. And, you know, I really didn't, um, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but yeah, there is some fumes, you know, for a certain distance. And there is a little bit of noise. And that was, you know, a concern. But, you know, during the hours of operation, you know, I, th I think, you know, it's not constant. I think, you know, the noise from the highway is probably more of a problem for the residents than, you know, this train coming through. So with, with the diesel exhaust and the noise, again, I was there out for a run. I stopped to watch the operation. And then, you know, I, I continued on my way. And I actually ran north on um, north airline 
and you know was, the train was doing its thing and you know, I was a hundred yards a couple hundred yards up the road and you know the diesel exhaust I couldn't smell it I couldn't you know hear much of the noise so you know I think it's you know not that big of a problem but you know if the, if the neighbor is you know within that you know distance yeah it, it, it could be but again based on the number of, of trips and the time it takes I, I don't know um, so that being said I, I as I said you know a few minutes ago I, I don't find the operation um, no more objectionable than you know what's been done before but again um, I'm not sure how to interpret you know what attorney small is saying as far as us kind of regulating the railroad operation which i think we have done um, I so. if i might uh, I, i'd like to respond to that because that actually yeah. came yeah. up in conversation uh earlier with attorney small but certainly with um your planner because at the end of the day the question is if the railroad is not subject to your regulations and that's a condition how does that get enforced and I think our discussion came around to your point, which is that if it's a condition of approval for the operation of his business, if the railroad decides to go rogue and, just, and, and do things differently than has been approved, he's shut down. So the risk is not the town of Wallingford's, it's not the railroad, it's just Mr. Palumbo's. Right. And that's why I thought it important, and, and I appreciate John coming here, but he came here to, to address the commission so that you get a sense of the importance to the railroad, uh, that they are committed to that. He's given us a letter to that effect and made the presentation. So that's, I think that's the methodology by adding it as a condition. Should the railroad change its procedures, that would be a violation of the special permit. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, other commission members. Mr. Fitzsimmons. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first off, I, I, I just want to make sure, uh, I'll try to be brief because I know this is the only thing on the agenda, which is sometimes a problem when you're the only one on the agenda versus 10 other people waiting to go after you. Um, you, stated, you stated on the record that you were with Wetlands for one year. Is that correct? Took about a year. Okay. I just want to make sure to state on the record, as you know, this is only the second time we're talking about it. <laughs> and, and as you know, if I had an hourglass in front of me, the, we're almost out of sand. So we have no choice but to act on this evening. So it's unfortunate, but I think in this particular scenario for this applicant, and you, you've been before us a lot, Mr. Zavia, I think the amount of time you took from October to January has served you well because you have addressed the bulk of my questions and issues that I raised in October. You've taken the time to explain the operation. I've had a chance to go out, as other commissioners have. I would agree with the two pr previous speakers. I, I think I had some concerns in October. And I think all the volume of material we received has, has addressed the majority of this. Just, just to make sure to be clear, a couple things that you might not have mentioned, I just want to make sure to put on the record. Um, again, based upon the, the October meeting, which is the last time we saw you, um, noise is a, is, was an issue that was raised by the neighbors. Anytime that comes up at the commission, we remind people it's a town ordinance. It's, it's outside the scope, but we do, we, we do factor it into a zoning issue. Um, I just have a couple quick questions. I believe I know the answer, but I'd like to ask and make sure to get on the record. Starting, if I could, through you, Mr. Chairman, to the applicant Absolutely. and his, um, the applicant. Um, who owns the trucks? Are they all Palumbo trucking, or is there other outsiders that would be used? They're my own. Okay. So you would have the ability to, so to speak, instruct your drivers, this, these are the rules of my operation, a right-hand turn only, 91 only. It would That would be your intention my, and plan. My safety director in yep. my office would make sure if you guys approve this that that's what takes place from now until forever is that I'm there. Um, and they're only my own trucks. That's why we can regulate. And, and if, you've, if, if you've heard over the last uh, few months that we've actually did an analysis, it was you know an average of about 3.2 trucks a day. Well, you can't cut a truck in, in that ratio, right. there could be trucks that went there five times today, one time tomorrow, no times, you know, in the last couple of weeks, we've been uh, offline per se, mm -hmm. 
and been very little activity, if at all. So we have the ability to to uh, know when the trucks are going to be there and, and when they're going to leave there. Um, and I can assure you, if you if you approve this, um, I'm glad I hadn't had to come more than what we've had to do in the last year. <laughs> um, certainly, I want to thank you guys for your time, but um, I will assure you that um, I will do everything in my power to make sure I satisfy every concern, everything you want, everything you need. Uh, we want to be a good neighbor. Uh, we our, our our yard in North Brantford is uh, we have been uh, gotten awards from North Brantford for how cleanly we clean, cleanliness we are and, and how we uh, run our operation there. So I, I will do everything that uh, you guys need to satisfy your requests. If I might, as a follow up to through you, Mr. Chair, but to the applicant. I, and again, I, I want to state, based on the information we received, and we have a lot of information here on this application, you are 100% certain of what you are offering as a suggested condition of approval. Is everything that we're offering? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. And I say that to you, having set up here for a few years, you are limiting your ability to be successful and grow. And, and, and what you're committing to us is you're agreeing to do X, Y, and Z. We're not gonna, we're not gonna have more trucks. We're not, gonna have, we're not gonna expand our hours of operation. The reason I say that is because as a special permit, we can impose conditions, but you're offering. So there, there is a right. difference, and I wanna make sure we have this discussion on the record. You're offering to say, I'm expecting not to grow. I'm expecting not to expand my hours. I'm expecting not to add another spur. It's unusual, but we've I've I've seen other people in your seat say, "I'll do whatever it takes to get a special permit." I just want to make sure that this comes up because if you are successful, which we hope you are, if indeed you get approved, you've limited your options. And I, I want you know, and, and again, that happens sometimes at sites, but. People sit in that chair and say, I didn't know what I was agreeing to. I want to make sure you know what you're offering because you're, these are your, your applicant's attorney's suggested conditions of approval versus us imposing. I did get authority. Excuse me? I did get authority oh, first. You, yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah you know, and and the, interesting, yeah. the interesting concept of this use for us is, is very um, specific, and it's specific to Latticrete International. We're not looking to bring other materials and we're not looking to, um, and, and the reason why there's an average of one to three to five trucks per day is because we load these trailers and we bring them back to the main yard. So because Laticrete operates five, six plus days a week sometimes. So we have these loaded in our yard. So it kind of gives us a opportunity to really control this yard as we see fit and as we see needed. I mean, I, uh, if the highway were to be shut down and I had to use your town road, I, yep. and, and believe me, we, we've had that happen. It's happened and we can document it. You know, every truck is, is allocated with GPS. Um, our, our safety director monitors these trucks five days, six days a week and is able to, if, and we would probably know uh, through our transportation, I want to call them apps, and through the state of Connecticut, we get alerts when highways are shut down, when roads are closed, when there's tractor trailer bans. I, I, I will be honest, if something like that happens, we would have to use, and we would use the roads that are applicable for trucks, not no through truck traffic. Right. So just to clarify so you yeah. understand that. Uh, yeah, and again, I, I, I just want to share right. with you because I, I think it's Correct. worth, just, we didn't discuss it in October, we didn't get Correct. there, and I, I think because I think it was, um, and I'll be on the record, I think it was yeah. generous of you to offer imposing your own conditions, and I think part of it is, you know, if I was a neighbor, well, it's, they're going to expand. You, you're basically telling us you, you have no plans to expand, you can expand because you've limited what you are willing to, what you're what you're asking for as far as permission under a special permit. Um, much like uh, Commissioner Cohen, I, I would certainly like to acknowledge um, the memo from um, our Corporation Council. And, and I think we, we actually highlight the exact same sentences because my eyes are wide open that this commission has no authority to regulate the railroad. I, I get that and, and, and uh, I think Mr. Conley did a wonderful job. 
I have a question in addition to the letter we have from Mr. Connolly, which is part of the record. Is there any separate agreement between um, Benchmark and Palumbo Trucking with the railroad, or is the letter the sole document of how the railroad intends to operate for your operation? Is there a separate agreement that, not that I'm asking to see it, but I, I want to make sure if you were to sell or they were to sell, is there some documentation between the two parties that would that would expressly outline what, what has been offered and agreed to between you two parties? There are discussions uh, towards that agreement and it was pending action by this commission. Okay. So, again, would that be appropriate for us to include as a condition of approval that there be separate agreement? Again, things change when people leave. And if they, if someone gets their approval, we want to make sure. You know, my job is to protect protect the town. You know, and and I, I think clearly, you've out you've made your case, so to speak. But I want to make sure that things things change. So if that's that's okay. Um, the other question, I, again through you, Mr. Chairman, I wanted to ask the the um, town planner, Mrs. Hand. Um, I, looking at this and preparing for this in November, again in December, now January, um, I note on the zoning violation log that this is referenced as a sign violation of a complaint dated April 20th, 2015. I don't see any other reference on the zoning log that there was any other complaints or um, violations and I I thought back in October you were before us to correct a zoning violation or was it a wetlands violation and the sign is just the only zoning violation and that's through you answer, is, yeah okay um, there is a and let me just check the log itself but um, my the original violation was uh, violation number 215-056, so that's back to 2015, and that was as a use violation. So I just want to check um, this year, this current, because as you know, I don't, I don't right. update. I'm not the one that updates this anymore. The, the, cur the current login for this tonight's meeting only lists the sign violation. Okay, so it name. doesn't list it under the use. I did. I did see it, and, and I was look, looking under the address and the name. I, Let's stop. Well, well let me. Let me. Maybe. Oh yeah, it's it's there on page seven. Oh no, you're right. That's under signage. <laughs> under the subheading of use, which is odd. Um. So let me clarify what the actual status is. The actual status is that it is still currently, it was opened as a use violation. We had one initial complaint. That, that's what kind of set it all in motion. Um, and that was the, the, on, the only complaint I've gotten. Um, so it, it was as a use, there was a sign that was sort of affiliated, came under that umbrella that's, that if it gets approved, they need to get a sign permit. Um, but the primary violation was the use, so I think that's an, an error on the log. Okay, and thank you. I, I think you were going exactly the direction I was headed because their request this evening to bring it to get permission would remove them from the log or only the use, and they still have to come back for sign. Yeah. Okay, okay. That, if I might, Mr. Chairman, I think the, 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 the question, as the two prior commissioners indicated, I think the, the issue is it was... Um, outlined for us by the town planner and the town corporation council and we frequently talk about during special permit applications uh, when our people are trying to correct zoning violations um, i always have believed as is the the principle that you know the purpose of zoning is to eliminate nonconformities over time and and i still think that that's our primary function that uh, you know i i don't like nonconformities but they happen you know with a town of our size and our age um, Based upon the information I've seen, reviewed, and 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 was able to um, uh, listen to, um, I do not believe that this is any more objectionable than was previous there. I knew Mr. Frasina. I was out at his operation several times, and um, I, I don't think what you have proposed um, is more objectionable in character, which is the question that the town 
Corporation Council presented to us. So again, I thank you for your homework because there's a lot of information between the October meeting and tonight that uh, helped address that for me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Other commission members? Mr. Matarazzo. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just wanted to make some comments and I guess get some confirm some clarification on, on some of these items. I just looked at the application. Um, the proposed building you, you want to put up is not for warehousing of materials. Correct. Okay. So I think, with all due respect, Mr. Hines, the warehousing comments really don't apply here. Um, the building is not being utilized for warehouse. For, Correct. For, as warehouses are defined. And I actually looked up the definition of warehouse. Um, which is a structure or room for the storage of merchandise or commodities. So, I don't believe any warehousing issues are, are pertinent here. I don't, I don't, I don't think they, they apply. Um, and that's a great looking building. <laughs> it, it's uh, um, right out of a kind of a railroad rip, magazine. Yeah, compared kind of, to what was there. That. Yeah. I mean, I, I grew up in Wallingford. I, I grew up on Williams Road. I, I know that site. Um, I used to live right next to the train tracks, and I can't imagine the trains being any more of an impact than what they were when I was growing up. I remember losing count of how many cars would come by at one instance. Um, and I can't tell you how many coins we put on those tracks and flattened them out, or the ball bearings we used to collect to play marbles with. But. Um, so I got to say, um, I, I agree with Mr. Simpson. I don't think this is any more of an impact um, than what was there in the past. Um, I would say um, you know, I think fortunately, at some point when the zoning changed from CB to CA in 85, I think Wallyford dropped the ball. Um, uh, Mr. Uh, Frazina was uh, continued on with what was there, um, and I don't believe anything seems. It seems to me nothing was enforced after the the zone change. Um, so it's hard to really enforce that now. And I guess I'm not sure. I guess, but we're, we're, we're that zone's really the use is really grandfathered in. So. Um, it doesn't seem. It seems like a non-issue to me for what you're using it for. Um, the site is is much improved from anything that was there in the past. Um, I'd like to see more landscaping, which I think you've addressed. Correct. Yes, um, absolutely. Intend to address. Um, and I also, in looking in the October meetings, because I wasn't here, um, some comments by uh, John Laterno. Uh, actually stuck out in that we can't regulate the railroad. The railroad, or if you decide, and, and this is a scenario, I guess he, he commented, if you decide to sell your property to the railroad, and the railroad turns around and wants to lease it back to you to run the same operation, I don't believe there's anything we can do if that scenario did occur. Is that about right? Um, I'd go back to Miss Sand. So I, I think the it's not the claim that they're making or it's not kind of the issue that they're pushing. I spoke to Attorney Small about this a little bit and I, I think the uh, kind of her representation to me was that the, the railroad itself has a very high level of latitude, legally has a very high level of latitude. So it could very well be that they could claim an exemption um, it would depend on sort of the relationship between the business mm -hmm. and the railroad. Um, it, there's case law around it from what I understand. So it could be that they could, it could well be that they could claim an exemption, but it's very case specific. So it'd be on sort of a case by case basis. Never say never. What's that? I, I just said it's a, a never say never. Yeah, it's, scenario. it's certainly, um, like I said, the, the railroad has a high level of latitude, mm -hmm. so 
but we'd ha it'd have to be looked at legally on a case-specific basis. Um, with that said, I, I'm, that's, I'm all set. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Monterazzo. Anyone else? Uh, just that I don't want to belabor this. I, I think, quite frankly, most of the commission members, uh, you know, have uh, expressed uh, my opinion. Certainly, I think, uh, is stated by Mr. Uh, Fitzsimmons, the applicant, from where we were in October, from where we are in January, has provided a, uh, you know, significant amount of information. The railroad is certainly uh, explained in, in 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 detail as far as how this is operated. You know, there were concerns about the gates. Are they going to be down? When are they down in that? Uh, clearly what's being presented uh, by the applicant as far as what uh, its agreement would be with the uh, railroad indicates that that would not be an issue as far as uh, having, the, uh, having the gates down while there's any uh, offloading or, or picking up of the, uh, you know, of the, uh, of the rail cars. Also, I, I think as other people pointed out, we have no control over, over the railroad. Uh, and as pointed out in Attorney Smalls, when we start looking at what is not considered more, uh, not more objectionable is essentially, she outlined uh, the number of trucks, the number of activity on the property itself. And again, when we're talking the property, we're not talking about the property owned by the railroad. It's the property owned by the applicant. You know, as well as what the hours of operation are, and uh, you know, looking at the information it was presented concerning those areas by the applicant, uh, in my mind, I, I don't believe this is any more objectionable. And you know, I certainly do appreciate, uh, while it may be somewhat unusual, I appreciate what our uh, town planner has put together uh, as far as the uh, uses of the property. I think that that, at least for me, was was very helpful. Uh, it. Uh, it, it, it somewhat uh, verified some of the information that was given to us by the applicant, but I, I appreciate that because it gives me, uh, I think, more, more comfort uh, as far as what the prior, uh, prior operations of the property uh, was and, and how this may or may not uh, you know, impact uh, the property and the surrounding area. So with that, uh, this is a this is a public hearing. Are there any other commission members, Mrs. Hand? Would you like to make any comments prior to me going out to the public? Um, I'll make some brief comments. Uh, just quickly, um, I guess I wanted to say, um, I, you know, I also feel like we've come a really long way. I think I'm, I probably more than anybody have had a lot of concerns and questions about the site. And I think what's really important um, from my perspective here is that to sort of to Mr. Fitzsimmons's point is the conditions of approval that they've offered and agreed to in terms of reining in what the objectionability of the site might be. So because of the conditions, I think the conditions are sort of what put a box around exactly what can happen on the site and what and and in this particular situation they they can never intensify. I want to make sure you understand that that on the record because this is a change this specific special permit is a change in nonconformity. So you you can never come back and make it more objectionable. You can never intensify basically. So I think in this particular situation that's what has um, at least from from my standpoint, given me a little bit more comfort um, and and understanding this the operations of the site itself. You know, I, I haven't made any secret about the fact that it I never I'm never comfortable when someone opens a business without getting the proper approvals, but that doesn't really impact. And I said this at the first meeting, that's not really germane to what the question before the commission is tonight. Um, in terms of um, just a couple other things, um, the condition that's been talked about with the railroad, um, I think the important things you'll see in my recommended, if you were to approve this tonight, in my recommended condition of approval number two, that sort of specific language that in regard to that particular condition that I discussed with Attorney Small, um, I think the important thing on the record for all of us to, to acknowledge is that 
that condition is essential to the comments from the deputy fire chief. So um, them, so so that condition is important to it's it's a it's a important component of the decision um, that the commission is making, and it's something that's being offered by the applicant, not. Um, sort of otherwise requested by the commission um, and that that would apply to the approval and the site operation. Um, and the special permit does get just to miss to one of Mr. Fitzsimmons's comments. I don't know if this helps or not, but as you know, the special permit also gets filed on the land records and that will directly list all the conditions of approval. So we do have another sort of paper trail documenting that um, for the future. I just want to make sure I'm clear. Um, nothing gets stored. I, I think this was asked already, but I'm not I think Mr. Hine may have asked this. Nothing whatsoever gets stored outside, correct? Correct. Ever. Right? We understand right. that's not shown on the plan. It's not right. going to be. Okay. Um, and then just I'll review my recommended conditions of approval if you're if you are inclined to approve the application tonight. Um, Memos from the engineering department dated October 7th and December 6, 2019. Um, compliance with representations in the letter from John Connolly, Vice President, Operations Genesee and Wyoming Railroad Services, um, dated October 25th. Um, the memoranda from Water and Sewer, there are several of them. The most recent is January 13, 2020. The majority of his comments have been addressed. Um, Interdepartment comments from the fire marshal, dated August 21st, 2019. As I discussed, my letter, dated August 29th, 2019, um, that the proposed built office building be constructed in substantial compliance with the submitted plans and final height um, verification to be provided. And um, compliance with the um, proposed conditions of approval. Um, so the way I had f drafted the condition, the condition was um, compliance with 988 East Center Street, Wallingford, Connecticut proposed conditions of approval dated received December 6, 2019. I would recommend adding language that says it's part of attachment 1II um, and re-entered uh, into the record tonight. It was the same the same document, and then a sedimentation and erosion control bond amount to be determined by the town planner. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Sand. You know, before I go out to the public, I do have, and I should have asked the gentleman from the railroad this, because when I was looking at your conditions of approval, when it dealt with, uh, you know, delivery of the rail cars, right now, when you're delivering the rail cars, you drop the rail cars off on the, uh, you uncouple the cars on the uh, south side of the uh, of the intersection, and then you bring the train up and you drop the rail cars off. Are those gates down at that particular time, or are the gates up? The process you just described takes about thirty to forty minutes, so yep. I, I, they're up and down during the course of that entire movement. So, as you approach the crossing with the initial train, they would be down and activated stopping traffic. Once you stop to let the conductor off, they go up briefly, hopefully the crew, then they be, so they're up and down. So then the gates go down when the train backs up, is that correct? They, they do, yeah. yeah, okay. So that's where I guess where I'm looking at the condition of approval on the first one, you know, it says that the, the gates will be down when you're, the gates will be up when you're, when you're offloading. Uh, in your uh, letter to the applicant, you indicated that the uh, the cars are going to be at the at the back of the train, correct. So the way they're the way they're going right now, when you're and maybe I'm just being a little bit too detailed about this. The way it's being used right now, uh, at sometimes when you're uh, doing the offloading, the uh, the gates in fact can be up because you're beyond the intersection. I guess what I'd like to no, see is just I'd I'd I just I guess what I'd like to see perhaps in your conditions uh, and what's agreed to is that there's an agreement that basically your cars are going to be at the tail end of the train other than that one car that's going to be put a hundred yards or so from the intersection. 
Yeah, and even if you wanted to be as broad as while switching the facility at 988. Yeah, whatever, because it just seems right now. The gates will not be activated more than one time. Yeah, exactly. And then I, that just, way I just like to up. see something a little bit more detailed here because when I read this, it seems like you could still kind of do what you're doing, you know, cutting the cars off on the south. And I know that's not your intention. It isn't. And the only thing that would concern me about what you just proposed is it would be awful penal to Mr. Palumbo if at, in the future technology changed where we could operate with the same intention and result, but have it not match with the wording that's stated. So that's why as long as it's clearly stated that the gates will not be activated more, any more than while the train is passing over East Center Street one time, while switching East the 988 East Second Street facility, the gates will not As long as we can do that, I'd be happy because I just yeah. I, I just want to just have that clarified that we don't run into a and, and again, situation. And again, I have a Tilcon train that has a mechanical failure. Yeah. I would I would hope that Yeah, no, I, no I, I understand that. Again, when I was just worried when I was reading this, I said, well, it's kind of what goes on a little bit right now as far as with the gates being up when you're offloading, but then they come down again and that's the whole process. So hopefully we can yeah, and the intent, we, we, intent of my not, I, I understand very clearly what you One activation, is. and that's it. Yeah, thank you. All right, that being said, uh, I, I see Mrs. Hand has a... One more question and one more comment. Um, the the trains that are going through that deliver... Sorry, <laughs> I might... I might the, the trains... Are, the, are Mr. Plumbo's cars always part of a longer train, or are there individual trains that go to his site? Again, I don't want to get in a minute. Uh, if you just please use the microphone, sir. Is that on? Uh, don't want to get into the minutia of the, the, the operation itself, but there are solid Tilcon trains when length and tonnage uh, require. There will be a, a separate Tilcon train. Um, there may be, <clears throat> excuse me, also a local interchange, Clocker Metals, Red Tech, um, 70 Lumber Distribution up north of Middletown. Um, we have some local deliveries that, that take place up there, too. Like I said, Mr. Palumbo's tra traffic will sometimes get tacked onto another train, sometimes the, the Middletown train, what have you. But okay. it, it will always be placed to where we're in accordance with the single operation. But, no, okay. there, there's several other trains that operate up and down okay. that line. Okay. And in that case, you'd have a short. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, Thank you, sir. And then the, the other comment I just wanted to make that I hadn't made earlier is... Um, in terms of the, the sort of intensity of the use on the site, I do think that, at least from my perspective, I know I had gotten accustomed to sort of a very de minimis use on the site because the user was relatively inactive. But I think it's important to keep in mind that that site at full operation could have quite a bit of activity, whatever that non-conforming use was so I, I just wanted to make sure that was stated on the record too. Thank you, Mrs. Hand. Again, this is a uh, public hearing. Any members of the public would like to speak on the application, please come forward, uh, state your name and address in your comments. Uh, good evening. My name is John Gilmore. I'm a resident of North Airline Road. I'm nearly a mile away uh, from the actual site. I live more towards the Williams Road area. Um, but I can't help but to be concerned about the safety, health, and welfare. So initially I didn't know how the operation of the delivery of the train would make to the Palumbo site. I think that's been clarified tonight. What I don't want to see is East Center Street being blocked uh, for any long period of time. But I do have some comments uh, relative to the site itself. Uh, I don't take any objection to the proposed use. I'm not necessarily in favor of it, but I do recognize that there are some issues with noise and, and some things. Um, the whole process has taken nearly a year. Uh, I've, I apologize that I have not been able to make your prior meetings as I've had conflicts on those evenings. But uh, with respect to the operation, there is continued use out there. On November the 10th, November the 13th, I actually photographed the operation where they were offloading the train into one of Palumbo's trucks. 
I uh, didn't report it as a violation, but I just want you to be aware that activities do take place on that site. Uh, secondly, the if the commission were to entertain approving this project, I think Mr. Uh, Santa Viva suggested certain hours of operation, and I did not hear the days they were limiting it to. I think he said no work on Sunday. If that's the case, I suggest that perhaps a sign be placed on the building or on the site somewhere, conspicuously placed, that limits the uh, and notifies the operators, perhaps even citing the ordinance, uh, the noise ordinance. Uh, the reason for that is if uh, on the weekends or in evenings, uh, planning and zoning office is not available. At least there could be police enforcement action if that were the case. Uh, and that brings me to my next point, and frankly it has to do with railroad operations. I'm not sure whether the Connecticut Department of Rail Operations was actually conferred on this thing. I think they have some latitude and some jurisdiction over the rail operations. In fact, this commission, there is a precedent for you as well. Back in the late 80s and early 90s, when the Pilgrim's Harbor Golf Course was expanding, uh, you required an improved grade crossing at Harrison Road as part of that project. So it goes back a ways. That was imposed upon a private developer across the rail line. And the rail line, I don't believe, is actually owned by the railroad. I think all of that track and the land under the track is owned by Tilcon. Fee simple. And that uh, the rail operators are just that. They're licensed uh, to perform rail operations. Is that significant? Probably not to this application, but it may go to the point that Mr. Uh, Turno had about the rail <clears throat> purchasing the property in the future and perhaps expanding that use. I just want to point out also that Wallingford has historically been ranked one of the most dangerous communities in the country in terms of rail operations. Um, you recall we've had fatalities at our rail crossings, and I think that's been improved with the closing of Hosford Street. But I have to point out that this line um, operates at all times of the day. I live behind it, I hear it at two o'clock in the morning, I'm hearing blares of horns, um, and a large part of that is because there are unsignalized intersections, particularly the intersection of Williams Road. I should point out that this is a special permit, and because it's a special permit, conditions can be imposed. I'm not suggesting that in this particular instance because improved grade crossings are very expensive. But I'll turn to the rail operators and say that we've got seven of them along from the Wallingford at Tilcon. Dibble Edge Road is unsignalized. Williams Road is unsignalized. And south of that all the way down to Clintonville Road is unsignalized. So I think in terms of the comment made last month that's in the minutes of the meeting by Mr. Foley safety is paramount uh, to our operation. Yet these grade crossings are still unsignalized and there's certainly been an increase in traffic since the railroad was built 100 years ago. So I just want to point that out. I don't expect the commission would require an improved grade crossing, but it's something to think about. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any, uh, if I could point out, we did mention as far as uh, you did not hear uh, as far as hours of operation or days of operation as far as the site would operate on Monday through Friday. And the, uh, as far as the rail, they will not deliver any cars on Sunday. That's what's being proposed, just as clarification for that. Thank you. Other members of the public, yes. How are you doing? Uh, Dan Plant, 32 North Airline Road. Uh, I don't even know really to begin at this point, but there continues, continues to be things that are said here that are not going on are true. So really my question is going to come down to how, how are we going to enforce this and, and what's going to be done because since the last meeting there's been multiple violations and I'm not sure exactly the process of doing formal complaints, but we've submitted many letters as a community and things like that. Police uh, have been called to the site. Um, and there continues to be problems. And um, I'm not sure 
based on this verbal agreement of the train situation when we have no way of regulating it, how that can be put in as a condition of his going forward, and what can be really done about that. Uh, his deliveries have been on Sundays, every Sunday, for as long as I can remember. So to have the VP of the railroad say it's only Tuesdays and Thursdays is kind of baffling to me when we've pretty much submitted videos of it happening on Sundays. So um, I'm not sure how that's going to all happen as well. Uh, you know, I left for this meeting tonight and he had idling trucks in his yard as I pull out of my driveway. His new standard practice is he does whatever he does during the day with the trucks and then at the very end of the night he's loading up the three to five to whatever trucks he's got all idling there waiting to be loaded and then he must be you know sending them to his yard in North Brantford which you know hearing the language of this who knows if that's a violation in North Brantford not storing them there but that's a different question and then you know that's all well good in the, in the winter but what happens when i'm out with my family and my two young kids and we're barbecuing uh you know and trying to make dinner and he's there now almost every night five six even later so uh, you know I'm, my question is there's been multiple violations he's shown the bare minimum to even try to comply with the, the, this committee and you know here we are about to approve him so uh you know those, those are the issues that i present to you guys to you know, how, how are we going to take care of this? So, thanks. You're welcome. I think, sir, answering your question, if in fact this you know, were to be approved, that there are violations, uh, if perhaps you or any other neighbors see violations there, I would report those violations to our, our town planner. We have a zoning enforcement officer and would look to enforce those violations if they exist, much like other, you know, other applications. I mean, I can't speak to how he's been operating in the past in what he may or may not be doing versus what's being represented here this evening. But uh, certainly, if this were approved with various conditions, you know, the town would look to hold the applicant to those, commission, uh, to those uh, conditions. It's not to say that there's going to be someone from the town out there every day viewing the site, as we certainly can't do that with all the properties that we have. So to a very large degree, uh, making the town uh, aware of violations uh, to a very large degree is kind of incumbent upon you know, the you know the neighbors or other you know uh, other other citizens whatever Angie Conti 26 North Airline Road I submitted a letter that all my neighbors on my street signed that had various dates to Miss Miss Handa and the committee that showed you all the times he was violating it. This whole thing started as a violation. I don't know how you can sit here and actually approve it when he's been violating it and thumbing your nose at thumbing his nose at you guys this for a whole year. He's at he's there past every every Sunday he's there. He's there at seven o'clock at night, not just six. I called the cops the other day. They told me they can't do anything about it. Are you gonna extend your hours so I can call you at seven o'clock at night so you know he's there? No. And how many chances are you going to give him? Because you've given him a year to thumb your nose, thumb his nose at you, and you're going to give it to him now. I mean, we live there. You taking a running break and standing there and watching is not the same thing as me living there and hearing his trains banging back and forth, idling, the sand falling on the ground. It's not beautiful. And who cares about that building? Really? Because there's a building there. It's going to be pretty. If you're going to approve this, I have a condition. I want a fence around from my yard to his his uh where the end of the wetlands are that he already dug into by the way which is also a violation but that's okay right we will we'll prove them anyway i want a privacy fence so i don't have to look at it and i don't have to see it because you guys clearly don't care that it's there but we do and we live there we don't just run there and take a break thank you other members of the uh, public who would like to speak yes do you have a show of hands of other people who would like to speak on the application? Good evening, ladies, and good evening, gentlemen. Happy New Year to everyone. I live at 38 North Airline Road. I'm Mary Jane Zook. My parents bought the property in 1956, and since that time, we never had the activity that is going on there since Mr. Palumbo took over. We never had the trains running back and forth behind our houses, Diesel fumes coming at us all hours of the day and night, seven days a week. I personally called the police department after one o'clock in the morning because there was a train that was so long 
It was parked behind my house. These things shouldn't be happening. He doesn't live there. He doesn't care. He only cares about how much money he puts in his wallet. And I'm asking you respectfully to decline his application. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer Pendleton, 50 North Airline Road. I just wanted to um, say that I've been living at my house for about 20 years, 21 years. And when we first moved in, the freight train would come by maybe once a day at 1230. And it was like, oh, okay, kind of interesting. And the whole site at the end of the street was very, yes, there was a dilapidated building, but it was, there wasn't activity. There wasn't a lot of stuff happening there. And then, like, two years ago or whenever um, Mr. Palumbo um, gained access to the site, all of a sudden there's this sign, and I'm like, what happened here? Because I was like, what's going on? Like, this is new. And so I've been attending the town meetings and whatnot. But since we've been talking about it and this has been coming up for review, I drive down my street to go to work. And especially recently there's been a lot more of the trees being cleared, the whole site being cleared, and activity being cleared, understandable. But as I drive down my street now, it's very sad to me because it doesn't even look like the street that I, that I have been living on. When I drive back to come back to work, I see these rail cars with like graffiti all over them and they're there all the time. And it's, I don't know, as, as a resident there, it's a little disappointing. There has been, um, activity like last week when I came home from work I was working late and it was like two minutes to seven I was like oh okay I thought they actually had to stop by seven I didn't know they had to stop by six and I was like oh that's interesting they have like two minutes before the cutoff time very interesting and I was if I wasn't driving I would have written it down like and you know, documented it but there's just a lot of things as a resident on that street that there's just more activity and when they drop off the trains now where it used to just go through and it's like maybe five minutes now it's like I'm like oh what's that noise okay it's like 15 minutes 20 minutes okay now the train's backing up and there's a lot more activity than there ever used to be and I think if the site wasn't there that activity would just be the passing by trains that we're used to and not for the sole action of coming to drop off trains and whatnot so I understand when you guys say the more impact of the site but I also feel like just because things were a non-conformance before doesn't mean they need to maintain as a non-conformance. I think I said this back in the October meeting. Um, we have an opportunity as a town to gain back some of our land. And when you guys agreed, not you guys, but when you know the town agreed to build communities and houses and neighborhoods there, you know, it was kind of like a push to have neighborhoods and communities and homes there as opposed to yeah, at the one point it used to be a railroad and yeah, that was the site a hundred years ago or whatnot, but the activity for the years haven't really matched that now. So I just think that it would, as a resident there, it would be very, I'd be very sad and disappointed if it got approved, but I'm hoping that you guys will kind of take into account all my neighbors and whatnot because we really do have strong feelings and we live there and we are there every day and we are seeing with the day to day. But um, if it does get approved, it's definitely guaranteed that they will not be able to come and expand their business. Like that's part of a, a statement that's like written down. They won't be able to come back in two years and say, oh, well, you know, we've been managing this as a non-conformance for the past three years. I'd like to expand and whatnot. Like, is that definitely seriously like locked in stone? Or is that something where, you know, ask for forgiveness, you know, not permission? Kind of thing. Well, again, anyone can can come back or can make an application to you know to the commission uh, for whether it's this use uh, or any other uses. But you know the conditions of approval for what they can do with the approval of this commission are limited to what those conditions may be. Uh, I would suspect if someone were to come back with a with a different with an application to intensify the use then one of the things certainly the commission would have to consider is well is it more objectionable than what's there now so there's still that hurdle to be made but certainly the commission can't 
you know, prohibit someone from coming with an application uh, for expanding a use for additional uses on really on any property. You know, it's up to the commission to look at that application and to evaluate it. Is that a fair statement, Mrs. Han? Yeah, I, I think in this particular case, and, and ultimately it would be up to the commission if and when that were to happen, but or if that were to happen, but I think it would be difficult to argue that it's not more objectionable when <coughs> you're trying to intensify. I, I think that would be a very, I mean, from my perspective as staff, at least, I would see that as a very difficult argument to make. So if you, because of the nature of this type of special permit, I think it would be a difficult argument to make. But, I mean, as the chairman said, anybody can apply for, for anything. And as far as the wetlands go, have the conditions been met for the wetlands? Because I'm not an engineer, I'm not an architect. I did look at some of the big plans in the town office, and there was a lot of wetland talk and, and work that needed to be done um, to secure our community and our environment. So has that been completed? Is Where does that stand? If you could answer that, please, Mrs. Hill. Sure. I, and I don't staff the Wetlands Commission. I'm not, so I can, but my understanding in speaking with the environmental planner is that there is one outstanding issue, which is there are some plantings that remain to be installed, um, and those are to be installed in the spring. Yep. Excuse me, we're, if you have a comment, you can come up to the microphone, but at this point if, in time, Mrs. Hand's answering her question, so. So, if, if that were, I mean, ultimately, that's up to the Wetlands Commission how, how they would enforce that, um, but I do, know, I believe at their last meeting, there was a discussion about revoking the permit if um, that wasn't completed in the agreed upon time frame. Maybe Attorney Senaviva can weigh in on that, but. That's my Attorney Peter, would you like to comment on that? Just that the uh, commission has granted the applicant under its wetlands permit till May 20th to do some plantings that are more appropriate in the spring. That's the last thing that's left under the wetlands uh, approval. Thank you. Okay, and then how do we, if we do see things, like what is the recourse that we should take? Do we just call the town? Do we call the police? Do we take pictures, video? Like... Like, I've lived in the town. I'm not super active, but I'm getting more active in the town. And I wouldn't even begin to know who to complain to. Because I thought by coming to the meetings, talking on record was a good activity to do. But now I'm kind of kicking myself for not drafting a million letters and, and doing all these things that I didn't realize I needed to do. So. Sure, I think the appropriate action for anyone to take, uh, if they see a zoning violation, to report it to our, uh, you know, to our town, to our our planning office, our town planner. Again, we have a zoning enforcement officer. You know, candidly, the most docu the the more documentation you can provide concerning a violation is certainly is a, you know is a benefit in order to uh, you know substantiate you know the violation that you may be claiming. So I, I would encourage any you to do that, or again anyone, whether it's on this property or any other properties, because again, to a very large degree, uh, we find out about zoning violations to a very large degree by you know members of the community reporting them, because our zoning enforcement officer can't you know travel around town uh, you know all hours of the day, and I think as you know some people have pointed out uh, on weekends. Uh, you know the uh, most town employees are not are not working so yeah we I, I can also say um, yes yeah, so absolutely report it to, you can report it to my office to the planning and zoning department um, or to the wetlands to, or to wetlands the environmental planner if it's a wetlands issue um, if the application gets approved tonight I think one of the things that is useful from an enforcement standpoint is that we now have everything clearly defined so if we were in a position where we needed to take enforcement action, everything, our our ability to demonstrate a violation of the conditions is much, much greater than when it was much more abstract before. So um, if we end up in court over it or something like that, that's why I, I think it, it is so important that we have clearly defined 
conditions on the record. Um, and if it's off hours, it, we do have the ability, sometimes the police department will work with us on, on verifying violations and things like that. So um, it, it's, it's, it, it can be, it, yeah, so I would say documentation is always useful to us. Um, and and in, in this case, I know, I mean, I, I know I had a level of frustration too in terms of the fact that this was an ongoing violation for, for quite some time. I think having clearly defined parameters is helpful to us. Um, so. Yeah, just how this whole thing came about and it just, makes me lose a little bit of faith in our town in our capability to enforce and just, I don't know, and living there and being a member. And I just hope you guys would really consider what myself and my neighbors have shared with you guys tonight because we really do love our community and we love where we live and I don't want to see it go um, get more negatively impact than it already has been. So thank you. Good. Thank you very much. Yeah, sir, I'll give you one more chance at the mic, if you would, please. And you'll be our last... Uh, I, I appreciate that very much, sure. uh, Dan planning on 32 North Airline. I just wanted on the record that you know the information he presented to you guys about the, the intensity of how he's using it is inaccurate to what we see on a day-to-day -day basis. I just wanted to put that on the record as terms of employees on the site, which I just said I saw three trucks, or I should say two trucks and the employee working there. So he's saying there's only two people. The hours of use of only being two hours a day, he's definitely over that days of the week he's over that so the report that he's presenting to you guys has it's inaccurate and essentially so I just wanted to put on the record that he is definitely there more than what he's presented to you guys as a council so thank you thank you very much yes if you no no if you have a question please come up to the microphone with your name and address My name's Bernadette Tartaglia. I'm at 5 North Airline Road, right across the street from the site in the farmhouse. So if this gets approved, starting tomorrow morning, 7.30 in the morning is the time, right? Yes. Not 4.30 in the morning, 5 o'clock? Yes, that would be correct. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, they should, to clarify, I've been... They show up at, at 7 o'clock. They can show up at 7 o'clock. Okay, that being the case, uh, at this point in time, I would, uh, unless the uh, applicant would like to uh, make some comments before I entertain a motion to close the public hearing. Just if I might, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you picking up on this. Throughout the presentation, I've noted that the proposed hours of operation are the uh, 7.30 to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday and 8 a.m. until noon on Saturday. It's not in... I see that the paralegal didn't get it typed under condition number three, but it was no Sunday operations we've talked about from the beginning. So the Saturday would be 8 to noon, uh, if I might. Um, and the other thing is that in terms of the operation of the train, I just wanted to make clear that, as Mr. Connolly pointed out, I mean, they've been successful. Um, Genovese and Wyoming bought the Providence of Worcester line, which is what operated along that particular track. And that there is there is more train traffic, but again, as he notes in his letter, which is one of your exhibits, Mr. Palomo's operation is four percent of their overall business. So, a large portion, ninety-six percent of the vehicle of the truck of the cars passing by are are non-related to the site. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. And again, before I close the public hearing, uh, any other commission members any questions for the applicant, Mr. Cohen? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah couple of quick questions hopefully uh, and just to follow on to attorney Senaviva's comment there and based on one of the uh, uh, residents comments and I, I guess this might be a question for Mr. Connolly what what are the hours of operation excluding Mr. Palumbo's uh, you know traffic um, you know how often does the train run to you know on those tracks Spoken here much more than I planned to, so I apologize again. Um, there are no set hours outside of what we've talked about here. Uh, based on um, train fulfillment, customer demand, um, connecting schedules in Hartford and New Haven and Providence and Worcester, 
Uh, there's a lot of variables that go into when we run our trains, how big we run our trains, etc. Uh, like I stated earlier, and um, I apologize that our business development has led to some of this frustration. So it seems like a lot of anger is, you know, being poured out towards Mr. Palumbo, but I wanted to clarify for everybody in the room that for every hundred car that goes over East Center Street, only four of the cars belong to Mr. Palumbo. Between Middletown, Rocky Hill, um, Hartford itself, where we're interchanging a lot of our traffic that used to have to come all the way to Worcester and then down through Providence and then over to New Haven and then up is now coming straight directly from Springfield on down. So there is a seven day a week, 24 hour operation that goes on outside of anything that Mr. Palumbo does, nor does Mr. Palumbo's operation have any bearing on that. So some of this frustration, unfortunately, is going to continue because on Sundays, you will see trains going up and down this line. Um, on Saturday evenings, you will see, and we try and minimize that, but it, it, the, the conditions, and I just want to be clear, so I'm making sure everybody's on the same page. The conditions we're talking about are only switching the facility at 988 East Center Street. The rest of this line um, will remain active and is key to one of our strategies when we bought the PW. I think the commission members understand that. All right, and I wanted to make sure, Mr. Kohar, I, I had a question. Well, yes and no. Uh, it, to, to one of the residents' uh, points where, you know, they stated that there appeared to be a train idling uh, somewhere in that area at 2 a.m., I mean, is, is that a normal? It's uh, certainly not normal, no, but it does happen. So okay. if one of our crews going up right. to interchange with CSX up in Hartford, um, or Springfield gets tangled up with their main line traffic. Sure. These crews sure. can only work okay. 12 hours a day. So there are times where there might be a train stuck somewhere for a couple hours before I transport a new crew to it. Okay. Yep. That Perfect. That answer. Thank you. And then just one other comment. I, th I think one of the residents, um, you know, had, had, a, had a decent idea with, um, you know, maybe this could be, a, you know, a condition of approval uh, since <laughs> the police uh, do seem to hang out on this uh, uh, corner quite a bit that uh, you know posting the uh, hours of operation on the building might might be a good idea um, So I just wanted to throw that out there as well. Thank you other commission members Mr. Matarazzo um, To you mr. Chairman maybe to direct it to Ms. Hand um, the violation that we keep referencing here is due to the zoning change in 1985? No, the, vi the violation is the current use of the property. As, because it's not an unapproved use. So they, had, they changed from one non-conforming use to a different non-conforming use without getting that vetted. So basically because they didn't get the the approvals. If they if they are approved tonight, then that violation is addressed. Right. And that and that. So That's that, why they're here to correct the fact that they didn't go through the procedures. In the they first didn't place. go through the process, and so there was no discussion right. about the operation or that type of thing. Right. Now the violation that's being corrected, which pertains to the use of the property. Sorry, say that again. Pertains to the use of the property, the violation. Right, and then there's also the previous mentioned sign violation, which I assume, it, it, that was one of the comments on, on my letter, so presumably, mm -hmm. so they'll have to address that as a condition. The but that's, that's just a paperwork. Use thing. violation. Um, but the use violation goes back to 85 when the zone was changed. And that when the zoning use. was changed it, it was really it really didn't matter because the use continued so the use was grandfathered in at the time okay so if the use is grandfathered in because it didn't matter in 85 is there in fact then a violation of use their use is different from the use that was there then that's the issue it's a different non-conforming use a different non-conforming use um so in the same way, the use then was what warehousing? Yes, it, and according to no the information I have. Yeah, because there's no warehousing, their use is in violation. They're proposing a trans, uh, essentially a transloading and distribution facility. Okay. But no warehousing, so correct. Okay. 
Okay, I just. <laughs> Thank you. And before I uh, close our public hearing, do you uh, have any final comments you'd like to make? I just wanted to, Mr. Senaviva, I just wanted to make sure I, I heard that correctly. So hours of operation for Saturdays are 8 a.m. to noon. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, yes ma'am. For the business? Yes, ma'am. Okay. okay. Does the commission catch that? So that should be in, reflected in the Good. conditions. At this point in time, Casey, on so for what was in that let's see that document, we're gonna change it to eight a.m. On this, he's saying it's eight o'clock. What was handed out? Am I correct? Correct. That the, the, what he handed well, out to us. It did right. say eight to nine, but, but it didn't get that, transferred to the conditions. That document isn't referenced in the recommended conditions. Okay. The document that's referenced is the proposed conditions of approval document. Okay. And that states um, that only talks about the Monday through Friday hours. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So Monday that through Friday is 7.30 to 6 with the trucks being able to, to arrive at 7. Correct. And then Saturday is 8 to noon. Eight to noon, right? Seeing no other questions from the uh, commission, I'd entertain a motion to close our public hearing. I'll let you just make one very brief comment, if you would, please. Mr. Matarazzo, to know because you weren't here at the first meeting we went to. The only reason he's again, if you, uh, if you my please. name. Yeah, name it. Um, Angie Please. Conti, 26 North Airline Road, that the only reason he's applied now for the permit to correct the violation is because he was caught. If he wasn't caught, he'd still be doing this right now, unpermitted, and not worrying about it. Thank you. At this point in time, I'd entertain a motion to close our public hearing. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we close the public hearing for application 411-19, special permit distribution operation in office benchmark Land Development, LLC, 988 East Center Street. We have a motion to close the public hearing. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. Uh, voting begin with Mr. Uh, Cohan, please. Yes. 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 And yes, at this point in time, I've entertained a motion on the application. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we approve application 411-19, Special Permit Distribution Operations and Office, Benchmark Land Development, LLC, 98 East Center Street. Uh, special Permit Change in Non-Conforming Use for Benchmark Land Development, LLC, to allow a distribution rail transloading operation at 988 East Center Street, as shown on plans entitled Palumbo Trucking, 988 East Center Street, Wallingford, Connecticut, prepared for Benchmark Land Development, LLC, 988 East Center Street, Wallingford, Connecticut, dated March 26, 2019, revised to October 9, 2019, subject to memoranda from uh, Rob Baltramitis, Department of Engineering, dated October 7, 2019, and December 6, 2019, compliance with representations in letter from John Connolly, Vice President, Operations, Genesee and Wyoming Railroad Service, Inc., to Dennis Seneviva, uh, uh, dated November 25th, 2019, and a material representation from the Commission is relying upon in granting this approval, including but not solely in regard to comments from Deputy Fire Chief Joseph Sentnar dated January 3rd, 2020. An inner office memorandum from uh, Eric Kruger, Senior Engineer, Water and Sewer Division, dated September 6, 2019, November 6, 2019, January 8th, 2020, and January 13th, 2020. An interdepartmental referral from the Office of the Fire Marshal, dated August 21st, 2019. A letter from Casey Hand, town planner to Benchmark Land Development dated August 29, 2019, including provisions of required 20-foot uh, landscaping area. A proposed office building to be constructed in sub substantial 
compliance with submitted architectural plans, final building plans to verify compliance with the height restrictions in the zoning, one for zoning regulations, a compliance with 988 East Center Street, Wallingford, Connecticut, proposed, proposed conditions of approval dated, uh, received December 6, 2019, part of attachment 1II, and re-entered and read into the record tonight uh, with one change uh, uh, operations to be uh, Saturday from uh, 8 a.m. to noon. A copy of the agreement between Palumbo tr uh, Trucking and uh, Gensi and uh, Wyoming Railroad Service Inc. Uh, there will be no storage of material or commodities from the rail cars and posting hours of operations on property. We have a, we have a motion on the application. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. Voting beginning with Mr. Cohan, please. Yes. 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 Yes, uh, your application has been approved. I'd just like to make one comment to the you know, to the applicant. Like all of the uh, applications that we may approve, we certainly expect that the applicant fully complies with all of the conditions of approval, and we certainly hope that there are no uh, comments made to uh, or observations made to our uh, zoning enforcement officer or other entities in the town concerning any violations. So I would leave it at that. Gentlemen, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Brings us to our next order of business. It's uh, new business. It's a, a site plan, residential and commercial. Old Colony Associates, LLC, 1268 North Colony Road. Mr. Matarazzo, if you'd please uh, note all correspondence for the record. If the applicant is here, if you'd please come forward to prepare, to prepare for his presentation. Mr. Chairman, we have an uh, interdepartmental referral referencing application 201-20 dated December 4th, 2019, signed by the fire marshal. We have correspondence dated December 31st, 2019, uh, referencing site plan 201-20. Um, we have... I think that's it, Mr. Menorazzo. Is that it? And... Oh, yep. Mrs. Hand, is it fair to say the applicant is not here? It would appear not. I was going to ask uh, Mr. Matarazzo to uh, read your, uh, your letter into the record, but uh, given the fact that the applicant is not here, and I know that there are some issues with the application, but I think there'd be no, no reason to discuss that other than uh, considering continuing this to our uh, next uh, next meeting if you would uh, think that that's the appropriate action. Yeah, you can continue this to your February meeting without consent. Beyond that, we need consent from the applicant. Okay. I guess I'd uh, ask a uh, motion from the commission if they agree to continue this uh, to our uh, February meeting. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we continue application 201-20, site plan, residential and commercial. Old Colony Associates, LLC, 1260 Old Colony Road until February. We have a second. Second. Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed abstentions? Moving on. At this point in time, Mrs. Han, I'll uh, ask you if you just continue with our genuine agenda, beginning with the uh, uh, recommendations for bond releases and or reduction. Okay, uh, we are recommending release of the bond for Pilgrim's Harbor at 37 Harrison Road. Do we have a uh, motion to approve the bond release as recommended by our town planner? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we release the a bond for special permit Pilgrim Harbor, 37 Harrison Road, application 403-17. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Moving on. I guess we have a discussion and possible action for uh, FAA lighting required for uh, Eversource transmission line to rebuild the project. Uh, and I see we have the uh, applicant is before us. If Mrs. Hand, if you have any comments before I ask the applicant to... I'll let Mr. Bucari is from the electric division, so okay. I'll let him sort of explain it. But I just wanted to say, say I think um, 
really what this request is for is for um, extension of an underground, a, sm a, a small extension by the electric division of an existing underground, uh, of an existing overhead, overhead line, which requires approval from the Planning and Zoning Commission. And again, if the gentleman please introduce himself and uh, begin his pre presentation, which I'm sure will be brief. Sure. <laughs> yes, I will try to keep it brief. Um, yeah, just as case, Tony Bucari, uh, General Manager of Wallingford Electric Division. Um, as uh, Casey stated... Um, if we could just refer to our town planner as Mrs. Hand instead Mrs. of Casey. Hand, sorry. I appreciate that. As Thank Mrs. you. Mrs. Hand stated. Um, this isn't uh, an application for FAA lighting. I just want to make that clear. Um, that, that process is something that Eversource has gone through with the uh, Connecticut Siting Council for this project. They are um, rebuilding uh, the, it's, it's a transmission line that runs through um, Wallingford and as part of the approval process when they do a rebuild on, on those lines they have to bring them up to current standards. Um, in order to do so because of its proximity to the Hanover Airport uh, there's an FAA lighting requirement. Um, because they are in our service territory we have to provide the electrical service uh, for those lights um, and in three uh, locations, they've uh, approached us to serve uh, the lights. Um, two of the locations are very straightforward. Um, they can take service uh, from uh, a pole that's within very close proximity to their existing right-of-way um, and, and go underground. And in this particular location, it's several um, pole sections away. Um, we are requesting uh, to do this uh, in overhead uh, construction. Basically, installing three poles on Hanover, um, you'll see them there. Uh, do you have the drawing, mm -hmm. Mrs. Hand? Uh, yes, we do. Okay, excellent. So you'll see the three poles that we've referenced there. And what that'll <clears throat> do is um, get us right to the edge of the Eversource right-of-way, and any extension beyond that point uh, towards the um, the airport up Hanover Street would have to be underground. Um, there's not enough uh, electrical clearance to uh, feed a distribution line underneath those transmission lines. And it would set us up in the future um, in the event that there is an expansion at the airport to allow Wallingford Electric Division to serve that. Um, currently there's, uh, I'm sure you're aware of, they're uh, building new hangars there. Um, they, they have approached us to serve the hangers. Um, we reviewed it. They could serve those hangers from their current on-site power. Um, so it wouldn't require, because all they're proposing right now is lighting, it would not require us to um, do an extension uh, to the airport. But in the future, if they add HVAC or any, anything else, we would want to be able to serve that load. So that's, unless there's any additional questions, that's kind of what we're here for. Good. Thank you. Commission members with any questions for the applicant? I'll, I'll just ask one quick question. This this in no way impacts the, the landing at the airport or the airport operation you know, as far as flights and things like that. Uh, our, our service and our poles or the well flight? building erecting the poles yeah. Oh uh, no! That, I mean, that's gone through all of the the I think so, requirements. No. I wanted to ask. Thank Correct. you. Yeah. Thank you. And Mrs. Hand, any comments? Okay. Seeing no further comments from commission members, uh, again, I this is not a public hearing, but uh, does anyone from the audience like to uh, seeing none? I bring it back to uh, the commission for uh, motion on the application. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I mo I. Make a motion that we approve the uh, FAA lighting required uh, for Eversource's transmission line rebuild project. Do I have a uh, second? Second. Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons, voting beginning with Mr. Cohan. Can, can I just yes. point yes. a clarification? Yes. We, uh, okay. Um, what you're actually approving is the extension of the above ground le electric line as proposed. To serve the lighting. To serve the lighting, yeah. So if you'd like to amend your. Uh, yes, what she said. <laughs> Second what he said. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess we'll be voting on everything that uh, they said. Uh, voting beginning with um, Mr. Cohan, please. 
Yes. 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 And yes, the application has been approved. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Hand, if you take us through uh, the rest of our uh, agenda for reports of the officers and staff. Sure. Um, okay, administrative approvals. You have two. Any questions? Comments? Anything? Any questions for Mrs. Hand? Okay. Um, workshops. Uh, so uh, the this should actually say IX, I5, and Town Center Zone. Um, as you're all aware, we I distributed a doodle poll, and uh, it looks like the date, the winning date, is February 4th to hold a workshop. Um, for discussion of both the IXI5 zones and the town center um, reg. So in terms of the town center, the majority of that is sort of, um, I had already, I've already provided, I, I had already provided you with copies of it, but essentially that's to clarify some things in our new regs, kind of make some things a little bit clearer, a little bit cleaner, um, and things of that nature. Um, and also the uh, potential for, um, or a, a dis I want to, I think, have a discussion about, um, a brief discussion about potential, the restriction on office use on the first floor than the front of the building, which has come up recently, um, and um, make some uh, recommendations about how you might discuss that moving forward and some activities that the EDC is undertaking um, that might inform that in the future. Um, and then in terms of the, so uh, you did get a copy of my recommended changes. Um, I printed out additional ones in case anybody wants another copy. Um, and I may be providing you with a new one between now and February 4th with a few more tweaks. But again, the point of that is the, the primary thing was, you know, we have new regs in place a lot of times when we then go to um, utilize them. There have just been certain things that have come up that I think are, um, could be a little bit cleaner and a little clearer. So that's, that's the primary. Um, and then with the IX and I-5, that will be, I think, our third discussion about um, some potential changes to the IX, I-5 zones. Those proposed amendments are in your packets as well. Um, so that's February 4th, 6 o'clock p.m. Location is to be determined. Um, neither the council chambers nor 315 are available, so I'm, I've talked to um, Wallingford Center, so we might try to hold it at the hubcap. But Good. I will let you know. Thank you. Um, ZBA notice, there was no meeting uh, in December, so there's nothing for that. Um, for next week, you have two variance applications. One is for a second story addition to an existing house. Um, and one is for, if you remember, you approved an application for Protronics um, for a building addition off the back of the building on Parker Street, and they still had a variance issue they had to clean up, so it's to clean up that issue. Um, okay, zoning violations, I will leave to you as usual for questions, comments, concerns. Any questions on zoning violations for Mrs. Hand? Seeing none. Okay. Um, then we're ready to adjourn this meeting. This meeting is going to be immediately followed by a meeting of this same body acting as the Aquifer Perfect. Protection Agency. Okay. So at this particular point in time, I entertain a motion to adjourn this Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that we adjourn the uh, Planning and Zoning Commission meeting for Monday, January 13th, 2020. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Mr. Fitzsimmons. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed abstentions. We're adjourned and uh, I'm informed uh, earlier that we're going to need about a five minute break between uh, this meeting and our uh, Aquifer Protection Agency meeting. So at this point in time, uh, about a five minute break.